The end of the First Dornish War kicked off 24 years of peace under Aegon the Conqueror. To him, this was the first law. The dragon's peace would reign or else. The conquest wasn't so far in the past that anyone could forget what that meant, and no one tried, hence that long run of peace. Still, reading between the lines tells us that peace ended as soon as he died, like the minute he died. And that is a correct reading between the lines. Did Aegon actually rule well then, is the question. Or was the peace just because everyone was afraid of him and his sister and their dragons? Did his policies lead to the many civil conflicts that came less than a generation after his death? Perhaps even if he did botch future peace, he otherwise ruled well, though. So it's not a simple answer. We're not looking for simple answers. In fact, we're trying to get a little complicated, but speaking of, I mean, how much can we read into his actions regarding his views on the prophecy? So that'll be a question for us today as well. And that's not exactly the sort of thing we can take into account based on, you know, real world experience or examples. Beyond that, he had one of the longest reigns of any Targaryen monarch. He wasn't just the first, he was one of the longest reigning. So we've got no shortage of topics and rabbit holes to dive into on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. You know, before you get too into it, I want to point out something about the idea of not being able to read too much into it based on uh, real world scenarios that would do as far as like trying to fulfill some prophecy, but more so than you might think, like whether or not there are real world prophecies, there are a lot of people who believe in real world prophecies, especially leaders in you know, more ancient times and even Christianity prophesizes in Armageddon and everything. So like there are lots of people who do make some decisions based on prophecies. Uh, and, and Sean, you're really bearing the lead here because you have been telling us how you expect Ragnarok is coming any day now, for example. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I bring this up for a reason. Yeah, so. you, you expected it to come on <laughs> Super Bowl Sunday. So this live stream may be interrupted by the end of everything. I just don't know which Super Bowl Sunday. So <laughs> yeah, it might year, be a future. Maybe it's this time. Hopefully a future <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> every Sunday, even Super Bowl Sundays, maybe not every Sunday, almost every Sunday, including Super Bowl Sunday. This is definitely not our first Super Bowl Sunday live stream. We are on talking A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, and all that related stuff, usually. And it's at 3 o'clock. Uh, Eastern. That's when we do this, when we're live. But then afterwards, you can find every video on YouTube and then Spotify. An edited version appears on Spotify and then an audio-only version appears at the same time, ad-free on Patreon if you so are inclined. If you are so inclined, if you so are inclined, either way, whichever you choose, that option is there for you. We are about halfway through our topics moot. We're having a lot of fun with that. Three polls a week going up on our Patreon, picking topics that'll get made this year. By the end of it, we'll have chosen 12 topics. We've already chosen, what is it? Uh, five, six? I think six already. Yeah, so halfway exactly because we're choosing 12. We've got some good stuff coming. We've done authorial influences, historical influences. We've done undead characters. And we've got a lot more to come in that regard. And Worth we'll saying, totally it's head and head right now in the last Friday's poll with authorial influences and some and historical influences. I, th- I believe there's a couple that bla- the Black Dinner and Tolkien are like really close, like a few votes away from one another. Yeah, last I looked, it was one vote. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, we got some. If you're hearing this, you might be able to make a real difference in what topic ends up winning. If you're super pro or anti-Tolkien or the Black Dinner. We had basically the, the top choices from the Authorial Influences poll fighting against the top choices from the Historical Influences poll. And it looks like y'all prefer the Historical Influences over the Authorial Influences. But it's close in some cases. Yeah, it was kind of cool to... Uh, pit them against one another because we can kind of see our audience which they prefer yeah what do you guys like more than others i was a little surprised to see the the popularity of historical influences so much over authorial i knew i I figured you know both are going to be popular but uh, we learned we learned something at least we think we learned something (laughs) shout out to our good friend nina her blog is over at goodqueenally.tumblr.com that's one l in alley and the latest post over there is a question about Betha, 
is Betha Blackwood, is she the only, uh, was she likely to have kept the old gods even after becoming queen? And was that a problem? If so, meaning like a political problem, were other people at court going to dislike that or et cetera? And Nina really liked that question. So you're going to want to read her answer to it. You can also send us questions, either live or not. If you want to send them live, well, just put them in the comment box there and Ashea will probably grab it. Otherwise, send them to westeroshistory at gmail.com or interact with us on a different social media site. We're Westeros History on pretty much everything. I'll mention some episodes at the end of this one that relate to things we discussed during. And at that same time, I will reveal the answer to this trivia question, which is... The first king of Harrenhal died thanks to Balerion. How did the first lord of Harrenhal die? Hmm. Not to Balerion is the answer. So I narrowed it down slightly for you. It's not dragon related. Since the last episode, there has been a fairly big news drop that the Aegon's Conquest show has been moving forward. So that's timely given what we're talking about here. There's still no certainty it'll get made by any means, but it has a writer, you know, and it's moving forward, moving forward, meaning to the next phase, which hopefully will mean a pilot order, if, if not a full series order, which, you know, as we know, House of the Dragon never got a pilot order. It went straight to a full series order. So that would be better, <laughs> but because the pilot can get canceled like Blood Moon. So, you know. But that's also why they do pilots, because okay, yeah, the show sucks, and they the have best. like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah, I'm probably <laughs> glad they did a pilot for Blood Moon and not a full series order. Yeah, they might have tanked the franchise a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't know. We didn't see it. But if, if, it, if it had been bad, you know, if it was as bad as it as seems to As it seemed on its face. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's pretty easy to describe a lot of things in a ludicrous way that makes it seem bad when you're just giving a few sentence description of it. I will say that, but the few sentences that I've read about what would happen in that story did yeah, not didn't sound fill good. me with confidence. And also just just they'd have to be real idiots to cancel it if it was good. <laughs> like it's a Game of Thrones show that they spent thirty million dollars on. Like I, I I don't think they had the bar so so high, you know, like no, I don't I think it was yeah. really actually bad. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get too caught up in this, especially because I don't know a lot of details, but there are other things to consider. What was the budget for the rest of the series? Like if this is mediocre but the budget is only thirty million, uh, let's run it. But if this is mediocre and the budget's three hundred million, no, 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 no. It yeah. needs to be better for three hundred million. That's that's a good point. Yeah. Certainly it's it's about the cost benefit analysis, not just the total cost or the total quality. Yeah. Like one of our favorite shows, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, would have been canceled very early on, except it was dirt cheap. They were like, eh, we'll keep it going. And then it, now it's the longest running sitcom like <laughs> Of, of all, all time. time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Exactly. Live action sitcom. Yes. Live, yeah. Not, not, not animated. That's true. So we, we're pretty sure that this Egon's Conquest show will be under the House of the Dragon moniker because that's sort of what they hinted at early on, that it would be anthology style, but not single season anthology style. Although I suppose they could do a single season edition of House of the Dragon in some timeline. Uh, certainly that would be possible. But Aegon's Conquest probably wouldn't be a single season. Well, I guess it could be. Whether And so the point is, I don't know whether this is going to be connected to Ryan Condal in any way. Uh, and it's moot if it doesn't get picked up anyway. So we'll keep you all updated about series or pilot orders or future news. If it starts casting, then that's a good sign too. But anyway, it's, it's fairly exciting, but we'll temper our expectations because we know how these things work. They don't always come through. And well, that's what we, that's the world we live in. We'll probably have uh, some Night of the Seven Kingdoms Dunkin' Egg news to talk about before we get to Aegon casting news anyway. That's a good point. Yeah, that'll probably happen. But we'll we'll, uh, we'll come back to that when it's appropriate to. Whatever TV show news we have next. Plus, there's the, the, the Sea Snake, uh, Nine Voyages of the Sea Snake uh, animated series yeah. as well. They're so. pivoting to that possibility, which yeah. is, is good. If it helps it get made, I'm all for it. Exciting time to be a fan. It always seemed like a very expensive show, so that, that always seemed uh, like I mean, yeah, it always choice. seemed like... It should be animated to me. So, yeah, yeah great. nautical stuff like that. Very, very expensive. And so pivoting to our show, Sean, how you doing today? You got any, uh, any anything in your beverage today? What are you, what are you drinking? Uh, this is the Naked Green Machine, along with Magic Mind, along with what's the uh, 
factor old house oh. uh oh. protein mix nice Mm -hmm. And it's uh, and I've got a little ice in there. That's it's good. It's very green. It's pale green today. Yes, pale green. So yeah, pivoting to our show away from talk of uh, Game of Thrones TV. One thing we would like to do is take what George gives us, the way he presents it, and present it differently. What if he presents it one way, we present it a different way. Like if he has characters looking at the details, we try to look at the big picture. And vice versa. If he has them looking at the big picture, we try to look at the details. If historical counts show up in the text, we expand on them to make sure their significance is clear. If historical counts pertain to A Song of Ice and Pfizer characters, we point that connection out. If one of George R. R. Martin's accounts slash sources in World takes things year by year, we try to look at trends and eras, right? That's a big picture look. Maybe we look at how these events were viewed later on in the timeline. And if George jumps around in the timeline, we try to go year by year. Now, Fire and Blood does a bit of both. Sometimes it goes year by year. Sometimes it jumps around quite a bit. That depends on which Targaryen monarch we're speaking of. You can't really jump around much inside the reign of Maegor because it was only six years long. There's not a lot of room to jump around. Or Aenys, who preceded him, was even shorter, closer to five years. Aegon's reign was 37 years. It jumps around quite a bit. It, it doesn't jump around too much before the First Dornish War because that's a real big delineating differential within his reign. But within those last 24 years, it jumps around a lot. I really wish I could play that song right now. Which song? Jump around. Jump around. <laughs> yeah. Jump up, jump up, iron thrown uh, on, on my crown. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's why I said yeah, it. I was yeah. like, I don't need to play it if you can just do a little, you know, make up some version. Yeah. <laughs> that's safe for us. Another uh, little tidbit to add to what you're saying about the, the different ways to analyze it. Uh, we have this new wrinkle in everything now with this prophecy. Yes. That, that's a, another piece to however we might have analyzed it before that we have to add in. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we considered that as it pertained to the conquest. Now we have to consider it as it pertained to how he ruled afterwards, because that's preparing for this inevitable future that he saw in his dreams. Even if it's far in the future, it, it's his, some of his actions should at least be weighed against that preparation. So yeah, it jumps around a lot, both in Fire and Blood and the World of Ice and Fire. And in terms of references we get inside A Song of Ice and Fire as well, there's mentions here and there, especially in Tyrion and Danny's chapters and, and elsewhere as well, about Aegon the Conqueror. And those tidbits matter here as well. So it's hard to look at things year by year. We can't just do the year 20, then 21, then 22, because of all this jumping around. Later in his reign, we are going to do that a little bit because we have dates on say when his grandchildren were born and that's really important we can look at that time by time but today we're not focused on his family we're separating that there's two parsings that we're working with it's like a dichotomy of Aegon's rule how he ruled the realm and how he ruled his family and those are obviously connected because his family ruled the realm after him and there he's they're being prepared to rule during his life or are they and that's that's one of the questions how well how well and how much were they prepared to rule after him? And how well did he set the realm up for them to take over? And the answer is, well, it's, it's a little, of, little good, little bad, maybe a lot bad, maybe a lot good, depending on what angles we're looking at. And we'll be looking at several different angles. You know, I, I probably, I just now thought of this question. I wish I had thought to research it ahead of time. And I don't want to put you on a spot too much, but... How many times have we had a Targaryen king and a Targaryen hand at the same time? Oh, um, a few times. There's definitely been a few. Targaryen king has had Targaryen hands. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes only one. But two yeah. hands. <laughs> yeah, they were born with two, all of them that we know of. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there's been several because a lot of them made their heir the hand. Like Balon was hand, and before him, his older brother, Aemon, was hand before he died. Oh, man. Uh, Baylor the Blessed was hand. I was muted. You heard me, though, Sean. I did hear you. I said, said yeah. every Targaryen king has had Targaryen hands. <laughs> <laughs> At least one. Yeah. The uh, in you know later generations, uh, uh, they were more able to do it, and it seems like a wise thing to do. It seems like the person who's going to end up being in charge. At some point, should be second in charge. Yeah. To get ready for that, right? Yeah. But Aegon didn't have that advantage, right? He'd say, like, maybe eventually once his kids grow up, but even then, they're 20, but there's other people who are 40 with more experience yes. or whatever, so you can 
Maybe still you should make the twenty year old hand, but uh, and he did you, make his challenge. He did him. make his half brother hand, which he's not a Targaryen, yeah. but he was in his family. You can count. I would count that in terms of for purposes of this this category. But but well, you're right. He didn't of, have the choice the reason, of his own family. He didn't have a choice. The reason I that. wouldn't count it, and maybe even I should have been more clear. Not just the Targaryen hand, but the heir. The oh, okay, yeah. End up being in charge. Boris wasn't the heir. That's so, yeah. I think about the best way to. Now maybe they need to be trained up to that point too, and that's another challenge. Is it, at the time they're not ready for that? So if we're being technical, though, at the time before Aenys was born, there are a lot of people who may have considered Oris the heir. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it was point. unlikely that would ever come to pass. But like, if you're gonna, well, it has to be a man. If that was the rule for them, then and the next closest relation to Aegon would have been Oris. So, and we we covered that at the time too, as a like a, a pain point for the realms. Like, well, if Aegon dies now, what's gonna happen? That of course didn't happen, but anyway. So yeah, I said Aegon's reign is the is the second longest reign of all time. While Jaehaerys and Alysanne had the longest of all, and Al Al Alysanne technically didn't make it till the end, but it was fifty five years. And oddly enough, I guess George likes the number twenty six because three different kings ruled for twenty six years: Viserys the first, Aegon the third, and Aegon the fifth. And Daron the second was twenty five years, so it's pretty close. Surprising, perhaps, is that Ares the Mad King was the next longest at 21. But let's not forget, he wasn't mad when his reign began, else it probably wouldn't have lasted that long. So that is interesting to think about that Aegon's was the second longest. In fact, just the peacetime era of Aegon the Conqueror, post-First Ornish War, was 24 years long. So just his peacetime, his no-war uh, era only, was one of the longest Targaryen reigns. Even If you count it as separate, it's longer than any reign other than those five that I just named. The Mad King and the Jairus, Viserys I, Aegon III, and Aegon V. So, and how many of them had eras, ha had no war in their reigns? Yeah, few. <laughs> yeah. Certainly Aegon V had war during his, Aegon III had some mostly it was the war that preceded him that set him up and then of course Viserys the one same thing he he presided over peace and then immediately it turned into war upon his death yeah which is also the case for Aegon so mm, yes mm, interesting it's a lot to analyze but I feel like Viserys did more to cause that war yeah than Aegon did I agree I, but I think I might be I feel naive saying that but that's what I feel right now I, I don't think you're wrong I mean the dance was a much bigger was the biggest Targaryen civil war. So it's also in terms of scope, it was larger. But but, like, but Aenys I, and Magor had their problems. Yeah, and I, I feel think like Aegon, Aegon gets some blame for that. Yeah, right. I think you're right. I, I I mean, I think if we saw it play out, we would see all sorts of things that Aegon could have conceivably done to smooth things over between his two sons. Yeah. I think it's a question similar to one we get with Tywin Lannister. People point to Tywin Lannister keeping the peace for so long. But did he really was that was he mortgaging the future to keep the peace in the short term? And I think maybe Aegon, that question is clearer. And for Tywin, it's not as clear because he, A, wasn't fully in charge, so you can't put it all on him anyway. Uh, but yes, I think, for example, the faith is the topic that's going to come up today. Aegon kind of just kicked the can down the road with the faith. There were a lot of simmering problems that just weren't dealt with, and they were left for a weaker king or a more violent king to deal with in, in bo both, really, uh, two separate kings, of course, in I'm speaking ways, of. In some ways, though, I think that, that is maybe the, still the best thing to do with the faith is to time needs to pass for your reign to be even more legitimate. Yeah. Your dealing with the faith is going to be easier as more time passes and you're more embedded. That's a true point. Yeah. Like things change. You need that period of the current generation sort of passing off and the new generation being the ones to take over. And they're, they were born into this world, this new world where Aegon is king and the faith is not quite as powerful. But the people who transitioned from one world to the other are maybe a little more difficult. And so, yeah, as those people no longer are making decisions in the world, it maybe gets easier. But it didn't necessarily. Like that was a good theory, I think, but maybe it didn't actually work out as well. Yeah, that's true. I do. I, I want to clarify that just because I think Viserys might have been more at fault than Aegon doesn't mean I don't think Aegon was at fault. Right. So okay. Yeah, I, I think agree. There's more so. Yeah. But also, I think Aegon had more of a difficult challenge, like we were just talking about. He's got to deal with all these completely new things. Yeah. Whereas Viserys still had dragons and inherited peace. Yeah. Right. He was in a better position to set things up for his posterity 
than Aegon was. I agree. And, like, I totally so, agree. And, and also, I think it's fair to say that observing them, and I don't even mean TV, I mean reading, about, although that certainly adds to the opinion, reading about Viserys and Fire and Blood, reading about Aegon and Fire and Blood, whether or not they made the right choices, it's pretty clear Aegon worked a lot harder. Like, I think yeah. he put way more effort in and, and tried harder. Uh, he traveled half of his reign, was going from place to place, where Viserys, like, when he went hunting, people, I mean, this was a TV thing, people held the deer for him, you know? Like, <laughs> so that wasn't necessarily what really happened. But it might have been, because he was overweight and partied too hard, so he might, he probably did need some help getting around, especially uh, when he was older, so, you, you know. Say, you say, you say, Aegon worked hard, and Viserys played hard. Yeah, <laughs> that's, like, <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> Tell you which one I'd rather hang out with. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, it's just, it, I agree with you there. Yeah, Viserys would be more fun to hang out with, no doubt. But, but the one I want to <laughs> hang out with is not the one I want to be king. Yeah, yeah, I let, let him just be a prince. That. Yeah, I said hang <laughs> out with. Yeah, not the one we want to vote for for king. You don't vote for king. Well, they just did at the Great Council. Uh, Aegon might not be happy. He's like, you guys voted for king after me? Like, what? Jeez, <laughs> uh, I did not teach you well. Uh, rolling over in his grave. But yeah, you don't have to judge Aegon the Conqueror from a moral perspective. You wouldn't even have to do that if he was real. I mean, you can if you want to. We do. It's kind of fun. Uh, the setting is just so different from our own. It's hard to do in the first place. But yeah, you can totally do it if you want, like we do. But ethics aside, we cannot definitely judge whether or not his rule set up future troubles. I think that's an easier conversation to have because ethics are more confusing and, and not as easily transportable from time to time and place to place. But... Cause and effect is a little easier to judge, I think, even in politics, even in fictional politics. So we can judge a reign. And we should never do the thing that happens a lot in real life, uh, which is judge a reign solely based on what happens during that reign. <laughs> it should be like what Aegon did spilled over into the next reign, what presidents and prime ministers and kings and premiers do carries over into the next term of office. So obviously some more than others. But the point is those rules are universal. Whether fictional or non-fictional, the actions of the powerful have consequences and impact well beyond their reigns, their terms, and their lifespans. And the bigger the power, the bigger those effects in general. And this was the most powerful Targaryen on the most powerful dragon at the most pivotal time in the history of Westeros. And was Aegon the most powerful man in the history of Westeros? It's an interesting question. I think quite possibly. I can't really think of someone who was more powerful. If you throw in supernatural power, then it gets a little wonky. I don't know. Maybe Night King was more powerful. I, but did Night King actually exist? Was Brandon the Builder maybe? Garth Green? I don't know. If we're post-legendary times, <laughs> I think Aegon's got a strong case. The relative ease at which he took and held supreme power makes a compelling case by itself. But let's break down what he did with that power after taking it. The dragon's peace is where we start. If you're interested in the sometimes counterintuitive strategies employed by politicians and rulers and such, not exactly the Game of Thrones, but the Game of Throne in this case, this episode should have a lot of that. The throne isn't up for grabs, right? It's about as locked down as it ever will be after the so-called eternal peace, quote unquote, with Dorne. But just because the top spot is sealed up doesn't mean there isn't power to fight over, right? If you can't have supreme power, aim for second highest or third highest or make friends with those who do have the top spot. There's plenty of jockeying to go on, to go on here, even though it's not for the throne itself. Many seem to have just accepted Aegon's rule because what are you going to do about it? <laughs> it's his way or the highway. So among those, there were surely many that were trying to become his friend, trying to become his ally, or just trying to get favors out of him. There's more of those people, I'm guessing, looking for power within the new realm rather than, say, pining for the old days or, or let alone planning some kind of rebellion, though there were definitely those too. Even though Aegon failed to bring Dorne into the realm, there were just no threats to his rule to speak of. There were threats to the peace, there were things to deal with, but nothing that was going to remove him from the throne. Not after the, not after the Dornish War, anyway, because no one was trying to assassinate him anymore. And... He was concerned, right? During the Dornish War, he was concerned that the way the Dornish War ended might lead to future rebellions or future up unrest. Well, it didn't really happen. Well, it did, but not during his life. And that's why we're starting off with this point of 
did Aegon just kind of kick the can down the road and let his descendants deal with these problems rather than dealing them head on? Or were these problems just kind of fundamental? Were they going to happen one way or the other? So if we're really looking at this, this cause and effect thing, really getting into the weeds, then perhaps the defeat in Dor did, did set the stage for rebellions against Aenys and, and Maegor. Well, maybe not Maegor, but Aenys, just not Aegon. So, and maybe that wouldn't have happened. If Aegon hadn't lost in Dorne, maybe Aenys would have had an easier time of it. It's an interesting question. It's also, I want to point out, there's other factors other than, like, it's not just rule well or set things up for your legacy. Yeah. It's which things to manage while you're ruling that may or may not be promised to your legacy. Like, maybe he could have done certain things while he was ruling to set things better up for his kids to rule. But that might have been at the expense of dealing with other things yes. at the time that he was ruling. So it's it's really complicated to analyze all. Yeah, that. there's no roadmap to what makes a successful king of all Westeros. I mean, there isn't one for king of anywhere, any book. So why would there be one and, for this? To whatever extent there is a quote unquote roadmap, it's a more developed roadmap three or four reigns in than the first one. Yeah, you know? that's very true. <laughs> so he had settled the unsettled regions well prior to the First Ornish War. Remember, we talked about that, the sisters, the Iron Islands, the places that weren't quite adjusted to his rule had to be dealt with. And then the First Ornish War happened. And after that, it was time for Westeros to reap the rewards of living under a very strong and mostly benevolent ruler. And by that, I mean someone that wasn't like chopping lots of heads off. And he was generally doing justice and yes obviously dornish opinions aside <laughs> he was very popular in part as we said last time thanks to rainies and her clever use of song and and music and things like that to prop up the conquest and prop up their personalities and just make good things said about them and of course it doesn't need to be said but i will say it again that there was just no question about taking him on directly in war so we've said many times on the show, there's hard power and soft power. And of course, soft power is more on the docket today because, again, Aegon fought zero more wars during his life. He never had to do more than threaten or just show up or remind people that Balerion exists. And that was enough. Uh, but consider how often peace, speaking historically in real world or not, is just a matter of coincidence, meaning... Sometimes the world just hasn't birthed a person with sufficient power and ambition and military strength to start something. It's like a soft piece, the kind of soft piece where things worked out. A hard piece is what we have with Aegon. It's no coincidence that people aren't going to war with each other. The worst Lannister of all time could have become Lord of Casterly Rock during Aegon the, Conquest, Aegon the Conqueror's reign. But if such a man existed, they would have had to reckon with him. Go If that person had been born 100 years before, they would have run wild, wreaking havoc, causing untold suffering, torturing people in Casterly Rock, just you name it. And again, we're imagining the worst Lannister of all time. This is a made-up person. But if Aegon the Conqueror existed, well, they, they could have still tortured people in Casterly Rock, but they're not out, they couldn't go out there conquering and leading armies place to place and just doing that. that they would have been stopped and stopped easily. So, yeah, that kind of thing is not going to happen during the dragon's peace. And that state of affairs lasted as long as he did. He employed many things to make that happen. The first of which we'll discuss is the hidden strategies of the royal progress. We briefly discussed Aegon's policy of royal progresses back in the dragon's interim episode because we weren't sure if, if they had started yet. We're pretty sure they did. But now we're sure this was a main strategy and it had... Many benefits. Quote. Gulltown and the Erie, Harrenhal, Riverrun, Lannisport, and Casterly Rock, Craighall, Old Craighall, Old Oak, Highgarden, Old Town, the Arbor, Horn Hill, Ashford, Storm's End, and even Fall Hall had the honor of hosting his grace many times. But Aegon could and would turn up almost anywhere sometimes with as many as a thousand knights and lords and ladies in his train. He journeyed thrice to the Iron Islands, twice to Pike and once to Great Wick, spent a fortnight at Sisterton in 19 AC, and visited the North six times, holding court thrice in White Harbor, twice at Barrowton, 
and once at Winterfell on his very last royal progress in 33 AC. It is better to forestall rebellions than to put them down. Aegon famously said when asked the reason for his journeys. It's a bit cryptic, though, because yes... That statement, I agree with. It's pretty straightforward in terms of the logic there. Yes, it seems definitely better to forestall rebellions than to put them down. But how exactly does a royal progress forestall a rebellion? He spent half his reign on the road. It really shows that this was important to him. There was a lot of work to get people to accept the new state of affairs. And not only did he not want them to rebel, he didn't want them to make the mistake of thinking... They had a chance. <laughs> you know, he doesn't even want them to just like, look, I'm going to crush you. I've got Balerion. Visenya has Vagar. You have no hope. Don't even try. He doesn't want them to think that they have a chance. So he wants to make sure that they're not stupid enough to try. Like, he knows it's dumb to try. Most people know it's dumb to try. But do they know that? <laughs> that's, the, that's the question that really needs to be answered. Nina mentions the contrast to the historical king of the trident Theo Teague who was derisively referred to as Theo Saddlesore because he spent his reign on horseback not to go on goodwill trips but to put down near constant rebellions now that it sounds like Theo had near constant rebellions to deal with well Aegon was more doing due diligence I don't think he was constantly putting down rebellions nevertheless it is a very strong parallel especially because we're talking about some of the same places here. Theo Teague ruled the Riverlands, and Aegon's right next to the Riverlands. We even several of the, of the ones mentioned on that list were Riverlands or nearby. Harrenhal and River Run were specifically mentioned, and then there's some spots in the Reach and and the West that are close by to the Riverlands as well, and the Vale. So, and it's it's a real world thing too. There's lots of examples of conquerors who spent huge amounts of their reign in the saddle or on campaign. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, famous philosopher emperor of of Rome, doesn't sound like the kind of guy that would be in the saddle a lot, but he was. He was in the saddle a huge amount of his reign. He just a lot of those philosophical musings were written in his tent. Of course, it was a fancy imperial tent, but <laughs> it's it's a lot less fancy than you know this imperial villa or whatever he would be in i don't even know but it would be a lot fancier than whatever he would have on campaign so yeah and like richard uh the lionheart lived hardly spent any time in england <laughs> let alone you know living there or or having peace there he was constantly moving around in europe and all that so this is this is a pretty normal thing historically speaking uh maybe not common but but plenty of examples and was showing up with huge crowds of courtiers, Aegon was making the unspoken point that he had tremendous buy-in, right? All these people are supporting him, and the commoners love to see him. They're like, well, if we're going up against this guy, uh, he's popular. Like, even our own people might turn against us if we go against this guy, let alone the difficulty of going against him in the first place for military reasons. So it really reminds people just how popular he is wherever he goes. That's a pretty big deal. Like, yeah, you don't want to go up against someone that's that popular. Another piece to it is... Bringing a thousand knights and lords and ladies with him just to say, hey, what's up? Let's have dinner. What if he was coming for battle? Yeah, you know, like it, it, it demonstrates a mobility of forces because it, sure you can fly in with Balerion and maybe burn up the fields or burn my castle, but you can't take over my land. You couldn't get Dorne even. Right. Yeah. But when he can show up with a thousand soldiers, that is like I could have the dragons and a thousand soldiers mm -hmm. or more. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a full force. And you would so rather this force be on your side than be against you. Absolutely. It's multifaceted. It's you, it's showing off the, the strength of his court and the strength of his army and the strength of his dragon and his and popularity. level of loyalty. Yes. Yeah, his popularity. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really powerful in that sense. And any lord who's having any sort of second thoughts or like thoughts of maybe going against that would be like, okay, never mind. That's just too much. I can't possibly, how could I go against even one of these factors, let alone all of them at once? Uh, and this was what Heron Hoare learned. <laughs> it's like, no, I can go against it. No, you can't. And you didn't even really get close to stop. Like you lost badly. And... Yeah, it shows off Balerion to more people who didn't get to see him. That's important. Another reminder here and there. And it's almost worded in a way. How do you interpret this, Sean? And, and Ashea, if you feel like weighing in, let me know. It says, but Aegon could and would turn up almost anywhere. It's almost like he's not letting them know very far in advance. Almost as if that's part of his strategy to just be like, 
Hagan's stopped at Crake Hall. Here we are, you know, let's say we're uh, the crag and we're like, um, the Western's like, is he coming here next? He's close. He could come here next. We don't know. He doesn't tell people. So like, we better prepare just in case he comes. And then he doesn't. And like, okay, phew, he doesn't come. Or he does come. And like, oh, we got to prepare even more. So uh, how do you take that? Do you think that means, how do you reinterpret that? I thought about that too. And I, I, I feel like while there might be some value to turning up by surprise, that it might be more exciting or uh, maybe, uh, a, a, again, sort of a demonstration of his capability that he could just show up any time. But also, I think it's, I think that the unrealistic and unwise elements over, overweigh that. Okay. Because to show up with all those forces, they got to be fed and they just wouldn't, the, the host wouldn't be ready for that. And also to show up with all those forces, it on some of them might be sudden where you might expect a month's notice, but you only got five days notice. But still, like people just notice all these troops traveling across the field. They would see Valerian in the sky. There would be some warning, you know, yeah. even if he didn't directly tell them, they would see it coming. So, uh, but again, maybe that does count as turning up with yeah. merely a what is warning. turning like, up? Yeah. Like, look yeah. at the. How long did, how far ahead did Robert have to tell Ned that that's, he was coming? That's exactly what I was going to say. Ned was a little caught off guard by that. He was like, oh. Like he's coming here, like oh <laughs> crap! But that was still like with they weeks had notice, yes because right? it takes yeah. that long, and then that was what they said. They're like, yeah. okay, we have time because they're traveling in a wheelhouse and it's really slow. But he was still fr Ned was still frustrated. He was like, damn, I needed more, mm -hmm. you know, I needed more time and more warning. Um, and it was like I think it's the first time Ned gets upset. It's and it's only a little bit, but it's like it's it's a it's foreshadowing Ned's relationship with Robert or what what's already what's already developed long in the past, but is new to audiences that you know robert's nothing like ned <laughs> and yeah. and and this sort of lack of planning and stuff like that is kind of a hallmark of, of him and what ned is getting pulled into by being made hand <laughs> yes here's uh, the the way i interpret it more so now it, it still might mean that he turned up with less notice than you might expect but i think it meant more that he would turn up in places you wouldn't expect oh, you would expect okay. if he went to high garden yeah. old town Winterfell, da da da. But he was going to Barrow Town. He was going to a lot of other like secondary, tertiary, yeah, Tarth and you know, locations or whatever. And yeah, yeah, like these aren't so huge names. They're big, but not huge. And and the, and it's a lot of effort to go to to go to uh, even Fall Hall. That's Tarth. I mean, that's it's an island. So he had to put all the that thousand knights in his court on ships, and he presumably flew Balerion, but everybody else had to take ship and all that. So that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Now, and I think that is also valuable because it shows that he's not just, I don't know what word to use, sucking up or butting up to all the he spread it around. nobles. Yeah. He's like, it's everyone, the, everyone is part of Westeros, well, I, the whole realm. I think anyway. the other important thing here is it says sometimes with as many as a thousand knights and lords and like that. I think not sometimes You're right. he, he traveled, you know, he kept it tight and he, he didn't have a huge huge royal progression and he just arrived on Balerion potentially okay or even that's a, a good small, point like, sometimes he yeah. might just show up a, some, somewhat alone or just yeah, like entirely I would, alone I would, I would guess for example that's that his point. visit to Tarth to Evenfall Hall was kept smaller for the same reason that you said that he had to load everyone onto a ship and take yeah. him over there because he also went to Sisterton yeah, and I would guess those in the Arbor ones. other islands that would be yeah. yeah okay that's a very good point now, it also says in that quote that some of those are it's, it says some of those locations were visited, quote, many times, which that's I don't know what you, how to interpret many, but at least three more than two. <laughs> you know, it's not two. Yeah. You know what I like to interpret from that? Well, those were good hosts. Those were good hosts. Like they serve. They got good food there. Yeah. And, he just loves their the, the fish at, at Tarth. You know? <laughs> and we have to look at patterns here. One of them is. They're mostly not in the crown lands. Like he wasn't going. He, it's not mentioned. Driftmark isn't mentioned. Like there's there's not much of the in the stormlands that gets mentioned. Where you know he's already got loyalty there. You know Storm's End is there, but of course he's got to visit Ori's from time to time. That's that's kind of straightforward. But yeah, it seems like most of these were farther out. And there's some that, like you said, Sean, are a little bit obscure, and maybe not that you would expect. It's mostly big places far from King's Landing. All four of the cities are mentioned, meaning the non-King's Landing city, because, of course, <laughs> he wouldn't go on a royal progress to his own city. <laughs> you know, like he would be, a, he could just walk out his front door if he wants to be seen. You know, it's like, hey, everybody, I'm still here. You know, uh, so that's interesting. And, and Nina reminds us to look at places that aren't mentioned, which we can't read too much into that. 
because they're not all mentioned. There's places he went to that just aren't mentioned. But still, there's an awful lot unmentioned. So there's got to be some that might have gotten snubbed, even if we aren't sure who they are. But, Sean, you mentioned Barrowton, and so does Nita. That's a really interesting one because they're not a true city in, in Barrowton, but it is large. It's probably one of the next top 10 sized locales in terms of population one of the the closest thing to being a city uh so that's important that he went there twice and he went to white harbor three times but he didn't go to winterfell till his last progress and so well what does that mean let's consider that it's a great test case for us to look at now, we don't know when Torrin Stark, the last king of the North, died. It might have been around that time. Maybe that's why Aegon thought it necessary to finally make a visit up there. Or maybe Torrin died well before that, and it was Brandon the Boisterous that was in charge. Now, we've covered all these Starks in our Under the Dragons series, Under the Dragons of the North series. And let's not forget that the Stark sons were very unhappy with the kneeling. They were unhappy with it to the point that they discussed rebellion against their father, not necessarily against Aegon, though if they had rebelled against their father successfully, that would have probably been the next step. Uh, that didn't come to pass, of course, and some of them formed a sellsword company and went off and did their own thing elsewhere. And they they were they protested the marriage of their sister to Ronald Aaron as well, this, this marriage arranged by Rhaenys, and that was not... So there was a lot of discontent here. So I think maybe we can maybe we can tie these things together and, and think maybe Aegon was reminding the Lord of Winterfell that, hey, I can I'm popular in Barrowton. I'm popular in White Harbor. If you start stuff with me, your own people might not take your side. You know, I'm getting in close with the Manderleys. I got a lot I can offer the Manderleys and they worship the, se the seven gods. So in some ways we have more in common with them than you do. Mm, are you sure they're that loyal to you when it's us in the balance? Right. Things like that. So maybe so point being a change in leadership at Winterfell might be the reason why Aegon finally went to Winterfell. It might not. It might be some other reason. He might just. Yeah. Who knows? But I think that's a, it's a strong guess, in my opinion. One thought is that he might have known his presence in Winterfell would cause trouble. Yes, I agree. Even if the moment he's there, they all like. Yes, sir, and do what they're told, but he still might feel like it's going to make things hard on Torrent Stark. Rubs it in their faces a bit, maybe. This. Right. And or maybe he knew Torrent Stark was loyal. I don't, I'm not worried about making sure Winterfell falls in line. They're in line. I don't know about Baritown. I don't know about White Harbor. I need to make sure these places fall in line. I already know I've got Torrent Stark and Winterfell. Like, yeah. I could see either of those. I could or too, yeah. Both of those. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. So I, those are good thoughts. And I think that. That's probably it. Yeah. Like if one of those lords, one of the, the ones that was pushing for a rebellion or discontent, if that guy became lord, well, that's a that's a pretty obvious red flag potential. But if it's still Torrin, I agree, then what's he worried about? So let's get further into how royal progress has helped keep the peace. It's one to just what we've seen so far is is a little bit of intimidation. Maybe making friends helps like doing the honor of coming to us like some some houses are, take a lot of pride in being visited by the king. And that alone would raise their esteem and be like, you know, this king's all right. You know, I wasn't sure about him, but he did us, he did good by us and I'm on his side. It, some, you know, that's the, that's the thing with pride, right? Sometimes it, a, a small, relatively small gesture can flip the whole thing on its, on its head. Like you, you go from really mad at someone to, okay, you're all right by me because you treated me well. My pride is assuaged. Now I feel good about it. And I think a lot of these visits did that exact thing. But that can't be all of it. That can't cover every single lord and lady. That can't cover every scenario. But it is harder to go with, to a war with someone that you've gotten to know, unless, of course, you've gotten to know them and you hate them. <laughs> it, it's beyond that, too, though. There's a value in bringing an, another value, that, other than what we've already mentioned, to bringing this big host with them. Because not only does Aegon and whatever lord is he visiting create some sort of bond, but all the, the mastered arms and the... The, the stable boys and the, the, the soldiers and knights, they're all going to interact, you know, but both his host and the hosts, you know, staff and everything. They're all going to have connections and bonds and communications as well. They're going to yeah. share stories and secrets. And uh, it you know, just think about whatever, like, you know, Robert or Ned or Aegon or whoever, they still have like a council and a family, all these other people under them 
that they have to account for the opinions of. Yes. And so you would like to get all of them on board, right? When Aegon shows up with his host, he doesn't only go into a secret room with the Lord. He meets with all the other family members and staff, and all of his staff meets with all their staff. And it's all of this is kind of bringing Westeros closer together and making it less likely for them to want to go fight each other. Right on. Yeah, and as well, I'd add to that, well, let's just have the next quote, then we'll go forward from there. Let's, let's read further to get a little deeper into what answer we're looking for here. Quote, much of every royal progress was given over to feasts and balls and hunts and hawking, as every lord attempted to outdo the others in splendor and hospitality. But Aegon also made a point of holding court wherever he might travel, whether from a dais in some great lord's castle or a mossy stone in a farmer's field. Six maesters traveled with him, to answer any questions he might have on local law, customs, and history, and to make note of such decrees and judgments as his grace might hand down. So yeah, there's the honor, there's the presence, but what else happens to a lord when they have to host Aegon, a trail of huge knights, Balerion, and whoever else comes along? Extreme expense is what happens. That costs a lot, especially given the above note about lords trying to outdo each other. I mean, damn, what is Casterly Rock, High Garden, and Old Town trying to outdo each other look like? Woo. The obscenities of excess there would be just off the chain, the Valyrian steel chain. <laughs> and this is somewhat exaggerated. It just has to be because clearly the Lord of Craycall, to keep using them as an example, wasn't trying to outdo Casterly Rock. Like that's just not feasible <laughs> unless the Lannisters were randomly deciding to be uh, penny pinching, which seems very unlikely. Right. And even then, then, well, what are you going to outdo Highgarden and Old Town when you're Craycall? No, you're just not. They're just they're just so vastly more wealthy than you. So maybe they're more like do a good job, do something creative or just not be remembered as the the, the weak one. You know, like I oh, remember all the different knights. Like you said, it's not just about Aegon, all these different people that are in his court. They're going from place to place. Some of them are making friends. Some of them are maybe making enemies, but they're going to get back to King's Landing and talk about all these places they visited. And the best and the worst are going to be gossiped about. Some will kind of be forgotten. They, some, some of these lesser lords might not mind being forgotten, but they don't want to be made fun of. They don't, because again, pride, pretty big deal for, amongst these folks, bigger than you might think. In some ways, it's like high school gossip, you know, but that's <laughs> whatever works as a, as a analogy. And Sean, to build on what you were saying, too, I really like that example because it's, again, something we see extremely early in the story. The royal progress of sorts that Robert and Cersei and all of them take to Winterfell includes exactly that. Now, we don't see a lot of them getting along, but we know that that could have happened. For example, Rob and Joffrey are practicing swords in the yard, and that does not go particularly well. It's meant to be foreshadowing <laughs> that they're going against each other in war. It, meant, it was meant to even be even bigger foreshadowing because George's original plan was for Joffrey to lead the armies and uh, they would have been more directly opposed to each other in the field. Obviously, that didn't happen. But still, people could have been making friends. It's, it didn't have to be a rivalry. They could have gotten along, you know, and, and in some cases that would happen. Like the, the son, like a perfect example of that is Theon getting along really well with Patrick Malister. The Malisters and the Greyjoys are, like, diametrically opposed. They're, like, supposed to be enemies. Patrick's father even reminds him of that. He's like, you remember, you, you know he's Ironborn, right? <laughs> you know, like that dude. I know he's your friend, but don't forget where he came from and where we come from. We're the Malisters. We, our castle, it was built to defend against the Ironborn. We are the Ironborn stoppers of the region so like be careful with that you know <laughs> so that warning comes but the bond still comes too yeah. there is this and, and and you also see Tyrion and john have bond yes and yeah good point and you don't see too much of a bomb but you know sansa and brandon whoever are in all of jamie lannister showing up it's and and you gotta imagine we're seeing these featured characters but you know there's got to be that type of interaction happening among dozens and dozens of other people. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah. So it's it's really does have a it's really a long list of interactions and people and connections and there's all sorts of room for relationships and and anger and uh intrigue, all sorts of things. So, yeah, it, it's really interesting to consider in all the possibilities. It's it's a grand 
scheme, grand uh, arrangement and lots of lots of different uh, moving parts. So yeah, how are you going to raise any kind of hell though afterwards? How are you going to rebel after spending all that money on the king and all his knights and his dragon and all that? So it's it's almost like that's a great example of soft power. You're coming to party and hang out and do you honor, but then afterwards you won't be able to afford to do, cause problems. <laughs> so. yeah. The resources that you might have spent, you know, if, if there was something you were frustrated with Aegon over and you were contemplating raising an army, making a stand, refusing to pay taxes, and to do that, you would need to like equip some soldiers and put some horses on the field. And but now you just all that. You just spent that all up at this great feast that everyone enjoyed. And so now you don't have the resources and people aren't motivated to go against Aegon now. So. Yeah. And it's the same thing. The pride enters the equation in a very similar way. Just like they don't want to lose in a battle. They don't want to lose in this contest of outdoing each other for prestige and entertaining the king. Again, the lesser houses aren't really in this contest. But Old Town, High Garden, Lannisport, all these places are like... We want to be the one that gets known, like Tywin Lannister, good example. Showing off our spending lots of money shows our power because it shows we can afford to spend a lot of money. <laughs> it proves that we can do that. It isn't just talk. It reminds people that this isn't just a rumor that we have tons of money. No, we really do have tons of money, and we're going to prove it here. And how much better is it for them to be using their their money and the proof of their power and such by making a painting and a tapestry and a, a, a jeweled necklace and, you know, works of art rather than equipping soldiers to go fight and destroy. Yeah. You know, I agree. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very smooth. I think it's, it's political Aikido at its finest. You've heard the cliche turning a weakness into a strength. This is turning a strength into a weakness or turning a strength into a different kind of strength, turning a strength into something that isn't a threat, turning it into a, a, a a strength for the realm rather than a value turning it into a value a value very well said good said you want to take pride in showing off your wealth well then go for it have all by all means do it just don't show it off and by buying lots of armor and <laughs> putting armies in the field do it yeah do it the other way and Nina says of course this this can go two ways dynastic hereditary monarchy as the targaryens had established for the, for their new state means the personal is inherently political if you're friends with the king, political favors are going to follow, right? So the better chance you have to angle for those things, the better your party is, the better your tournament is, the better, the more chance you have to like ask for a favor or to have quote unquote won a favor. If you please the king, he's, he's probably going to do you a favor. And the favor for Meghan the Conqueror is going to be worth just unbelievable amounts you know like it could be a tax write-off a tax concession or a, a, a new tract of land or something just something massively valuable and again i want to point out other favors can be one from the other people and and the entourage you could someone could give you some advice on how to plow your wheat fields better or the armors could yeah. exchange notes and how they get the steel harder or shaped and et cetera, et cetera. There's so many other exchanges of ideas or favors that could be happening other than just Aegon and the Lord. There's yeah. all these other people interacting that can give and get favors. From his council, his knight. Yeah, you're totally right. Like I'm like, I, some people may not be that powerful, but they might have access to Aegon, which gives them something of value to people that are more powerful than them. Like no wonder he went to the Iron Islands three times. Right. There's it's they're one of the most discontent of all. Right. Aegon will mostly allows and customs allow laws and customs to remain in place. He doesn't try to change that too much. But the old way kind of had to go. Right. The reaving. You can't do that. Actually, he did allow them to keep reaving outside of the Seven Kingdoms. You just can't reave in his realm. Like No reaving your fellow members of the Seven Kingdoms. Reave Satorios and Essos. Yeah, I'm not going to say no to that. And if we remember that point earlier I made about. Well, they can't beat Aegon, but do they know they can't beat Aegon? <laughs> the Iron Islands are the number one in that sort of thinking of, no, we can do it. No, really, we can win. We really can. Balon, Greyjoy, all these guys tried all these things that just were never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> or at least not in the long term, but they, you know, they just kept trying. They did Dancing their thing. Sean joined. And are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Test, test. Okay. 
So it's reminding the captains that Beleriand exists as much as it is reminding the lords that Beleriand exists. Things are a little different in the Iron Islands, right? And remember how easily Beleriand dispatched Heron's sons in their longships after the Battle of Welling Widows, which would be very on the nose for the Ironborns. Like, longships, Ironborn, Beleriand, what he did to them. Yeah, okay. It was easy, wasn't it? Remember that? They, they successfully raided Aegon at night and then fled back across the God's Eye to get back to Harrenhal, but they didn't make it before dawn. And once the sun came, yeah. that was it for them. They were literal toast. Because that's something with the Iron Islands. Uh, one, their, I don't know, arrogance and disconnectedness and different set of morals and their their distance all combined. And they're Not only might yeah. they have it in their mind that Aegon can't stop us, but also Aegon's nowhere near us. And even if eventually Aegon does go stop them, in the meantime, all the people of Westeros are being reeved on, right? Yeah. Like he's got to remind them consistently, yes. right? Like if he goes a couple years in a row without making a show, someone's going to get it in their mind, even aside from the whoever the, the Lord of the Iron Islands is at the time, just random captains will just decide to go reeving, and he's got to keep that reminder in place. Hell yeah, yeah, that's that's very well said as well. And to be fair, though, this may have been a little more due diligence than a legitimate threat because Lord Vicon, Lord Greyjoy was very smart about Aegon. He was like, no, don't challenge that guy. Like he, he wasn't one of these foolish types to think that they had some sort of chance. He told his son, Lord who became Lord Gorin in the year 33 AC. Don't challenge the dragons. <laughs> and that advice held until the red Kraken, which is much later. And then after the dance, of course, they were free. They pretty much never stopped, uh, except for uh, here and there for a little while. But once the dra actual dragons were, the literal dragons were gone, the Ironborn were like, "Hey, ships, we can get back out there and not worry about dragons." So yeah. But this era under Aegon was the first true death of the old way in all of history, besides before it existed, which it couldn't die. But that which is dead may never die. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> how many? How many times did Aegon go to Highgarden? Uh, it's many times. Quote many unquote. times? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we don't know. But I, at least three, probably more. Maybe five. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to guess five-ish. Because that's a place where the rule might have been suspect. Yes. Right? Well, the Tyrells uh, the, are new to be there. The Tyrell, so. Yeah, so he wants to shore them up. Like, the Tyrells are definitely loyal yeah. to Aegon because they're... He's but the super, people around the Tyrells yes. need the reminder, yes, right? That, and so I, I wonder if sometimes some of the reasons he might have gone to some places or another... I wonder if he's like, okay, Winterfell's good. I don't need to go there. I can trust Torn. Hey, Torn, where should I go? Mm. Who needs the reminder? Yeah. And same thing with Vicon. He might have asked the Iron Islands. But he he might have been requested, hey, can you please come and remind my stupid captains to not do stupid stuff? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I'm on board with you, but it really helps for your dragon to remind every random Ooh. captain in my multiple islands that i can't keep a handle on please come back again on you know? board with you good good nautical pun there oh, like yeah. hey Aegon, i need you to come be my anchor you know be the wind in my <laughs> sails yeah the storm is brewing you know i need you to <laughs> yeah so i agree with that yeah some of the some of them may have requested it like look like lord tower i could see that like it would look good to have us like sitting at the dais together you know laughing and joking together toasting just to remind everyone that you stand with me you know and Aegon's like yeah okay that makes sense. Hey, I was going to come anyway, but yeah, I'll I'll come a little sooner. We're holding court. I almost wish. Go ahead. I almost wish George had included like a demonstration, like <laughs> some old ship that they were retiring. Like, can you get Balerion just like blow this out of the water? <laughs> just to just see. Want to see it? You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Yeah, let's just just to see what it looks like, just to light a fire, just so you can, it, it's just to warm, you know, just for the spectacle of it. Don't mm -hmm. talk about what how it could be viewed by more warlike captains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and, and holding court is a pretty big power move, too. It's like, normally the people of any given region are used to seeing their lord and someone from that house, because it's been so long that these houses tend to rule in their domains. They're wit used to that lord or someone from that house dealing out justice. When Aegon comes... And everyone and everyone just defers to him instead. It's a real reminder to them and to that Lord where the power really lies. It's like these people have been mine. They're they're always mine. You know, before them, my my fathers or my mothers, or whatever. But when Aegon shows up, they just all go to him. <laughs> you know, just instantly. Like mm. it's a pretty 
potent reminder of of where the power really lies. And let's not forget, too, what we discussed during the Dragon's Interim, which was Aegon's policy of send me your children to be raised at court and to be hostages, which was in full and constant swing. A lot of these would be part of the royal progresses. They'd be a lot. They'd be those some of those knights, those thousand knights in their armor would be some of them would be these young nobles from houses that sent their second, third, fourth sons and, and daughters. In some cases, well, the daughters were, would be pretty unlikely to be knights, but you know what I mean? They'd still be there in the, in the court, uh, in the progress a lot of times. And uh, someone would, would have risen high in Aegon. Someone might have become friends with Visenya or, you know, uh, uh, what trained with, or East Baratheon's sons or something like that, you know, maybe even trained with uh, Aenys or Magor. Yeah, like a lot of important folks that could have had an opportunity to to rise socially. And as Nina remind us, the personal is the political in a monarchy. So there's a lot of power to being friends with the right people. And royal progress is continued until the year 33 by Aegon. Then they still continued... It just wasn't him gone anymore because he was too old. He, he decided it was better for his health and for the future for his son and daughter-in-law, princess, the future. Well, she wasn't a princess yet. She went straight from nothing to queen. I don't think you become a princess when you get married to a prince, do you? Mm, do you? I guess you do. I think so. Yeah, I guess yeah. you do. She was a princess. Princess Alyssa. I've just never seen her called Princess Alyssa, but I've seen her called Queen Alyssa and Alyssa, but I guess she would have been a princess for a while there, a princess by marriage. So yeah, uh, so they're, they're obviously a part of this too. Prince Aenys and Queen Alyssa, or eventual Queen Alyssa, were part of these royal progresses eventually, and eventually they ran them themselves. Now, when he's holding court and discussing things and debating and, and giving out laws and making judgments... Well, he has to keep in mind the laws of these various lands because, well, he wasn't trying to change a lot of laws. He left that for later rulers to sort of sort that business out for better or for worse. And here's what the book says about that. Quote. Can I, oh, can yeah, I real want, quick, before you say the quote, go ahead, uh, yeah. I just want to point out that we do, this is an example here, well, a moment ago what we were talking about, of Aegon was looking to the future. He was trying to set things up past his own rule. If these progressives start kept going past him, yeah, right? okay, that's true. Yeah, it might not have panned out, or is that his fault? I don't know, but it seems like he was trying to institutionalize this. Yeah, yeah, he knew that changing too much too fast would be a problem. It doesn't mean he didn't eventually want it changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, let's have the quote. A lord should know the land he rules. The conqueror later told his son Aenys, and through his travels, Aegon learned much and more about the Seven Kingdoms and its peoples. Each of the conquered kingdoms had its own laws and traditions. King Aegon did little to interfere with those. He allowed his lords to continue to rule much as they always had, with all the same powers and prerogatives. The laws of inheritance and succession remained unchanged. The existing feudal structures were confirmed, Lords, both great and small, retained the power of pit and gallows on their own land, and the privilege of the first knight, wherever that custom had formerly prevailed. Aegon's chief concern was peace. More on first knight in a minute, that's a big topic, but the power of pit and gallows, to be clear, that just means they have the power of throwing people in jail and executing them. They have the legal right to do that based on the laws of the land. Uh, otherwise, you know, because the, the state has to decide who is allowed to deal out justice. And Aegon is the state. So he's like, you guys had this law or this right. You still have this right. Now, one of the castles he visited that was nearby. I mean, we talked about how so many of the ones listed were farther away. were, were rather remote, like Craig Hall is the West Coast and the Arbor is almost as remote as you can get uh, from King's Landing and the North equally so. But they, he also went to some nearby places like River Run, and he was close to the Tullys. Remember, the Tullys were the first defectors from the Riverlands, and they were rewarded. He, Lord Edmund became hand after Lord Orys, but only for two years because his wife died in childbed and he went back home to be with his family and all that. But more relevantly here is the second exception to close by castles. He also went to Harrenhal. And Harrenhal is a bit of a different scenario because, of course, 
Paranol had belonged to the horror family and he had to redistribute it to someone else, which was House Coharis, which we mentioned Lord Quentin Coharis, who had been probably his master at arms, if not his, then his father's most likely. So a Valyrian, a person of Valyrian descent. Now, Quentin Coharis died in 9 AC, the same year that Edmund Tully re- resigned his hand. So this is well before the end of the First Ornish War. He, he fell from his horse and died. Now, falling from your horse is occasionally code for being murdered. It's like a hunting accident. It definitely could have just been a fall from people absolutely die from horses. But think again of like Rhea Royce from House of the Dragon. That's written off as a hunting, as a fall from her horse. But we know that's not exactly what happened, is it? Again, that's not in the book. But she did die from a fall from her horse. And that gave them license to consider it the option that it was a murder because it's just code for that sort of thing it, it's one of those things that yeah you can die from a fall from a horse but it could easily have been murder so yeah and uh this is <coughs> all the more suspicious because the man who took over for lord quentin was not one of his two sons because they both died prematurely as well I'm not sure if they were murdered or not but it just adds it to the it's it adds to the the <laughs> suspicion here doesn't it sean <laughs> so It leaves the door open for foul play. It definitely doesn't confirm it by any means. And taking his place was Lord Gargon the Guest. This is definitely not a man you would put murder past. Like, oh, no, Lord Gargon, he's too nice of a man to murder his family. This was a horrifying man who would terrorize new brides and their families around his domains for the next 28 years. Along with all the women in his employ, all the serving women and, like, women married to his own people he would just have his way with them especially on their weddings hence the reference to first night which is the right of a lord to sleep with a bride before she gets married on her wedding night this is probably not a thing that existed in the real world though it's rumored to have and there are some people that will tell you that it has that it did exist it's just not well documented i don't know uh but it was certainly featured in the movie uh, Braveheart <laughs> as a main pl- early plot point so it's certainly caught on as a thing whether it's historically accurate or not and, and George probably is aware of that but he he find it found it as a useful thing to put in his world but I think this is a pretty big oversight like Aegon's like I want to keep the peace so I'm going to allow this thing that clearly yeah. causes discontent and and re- revenge and blood feuds and, and does not keep the peace how is it this guy got put in charge of this Gorgon? Gargon. He took Heron Hall? No, he's the, he's the grandson of Lord Coharis. Oh, he was in line. Okay. Yeah, remember, remember that's, why just... that's why it's suspicious that his, fa- both of it, that his father and his brother were killed or died young. Uh, and so it passed on to, to Gargon at, at a relatively young age. And yeah, he's a very greedy. Like, very suspicious that his name was Gargon, a very <laughs> evil name. Gargon. We'll yes. <laughs> if his name was Gamgon, you wouldn't worry worried as much. Yeah, <laughs> he would sound sweet. <laughs> or Gamgok. His, or, or Gok. His name wasn't Muckduck. His name wasn't Muckduck. Yeah. Muck yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the I mean, let's bring this back to the point I made about the Ironborn. The old way was basically banned, right? No more carrying off women. But this is still okay. This is basically, well, you're not carrying them off, so it's okay. Like, what? (laughs) That's a pretty small point to, it's not really that big of a differentiator, right? I mean, none other than Alisanne herself, good Queen Alisanne, points out later how blatant this is from a peace perspective, let alone honor and ethics and parental rights and such. I mean, all sorts of other problems besides the ethics of it, which alone is gigantic. She basically says, what kind of man lets that happen to his wife? Come on, you lords and you brave knights and lords of the Seven Kingdoms. What would you do if that happened to your wife? Be honest. They'd be like, yeah, I'd I'd have to go kill the guy. Like, exactly. Our culture dictates that response. Yet, how? so how is this supposed to help peace? (laughs) It's it's pretty blatant. Yeah. Some Some crimes are forgivable by the mere passage of time, like against a family. Like if my father stole, or my, sorry, not my father, if my great grandfather stole your horse are you gonna come at me 200 like 50 years later for that you might but probably not if you did it's probably because there were further crimes committed in the name of that it it became some sort of cycle of violence but if that's the only thing that happened the horse was stolen 50 years ago and nothing else has happened since then I, i think it's forgotten but this the first night business someone coming on your wedding night and raping your wife 
You know, the family's going to remember that for a long effing time. <laughs> they won't, mm-hmm. and they will remember it violently, and will want to do violence to the people who did that. Yeah, so it's just pretty blatant, <laughs> right? You know, if you're trying to imagine from Aegon's point of view, he's like, well, if I take this right away from these aren't these aren't common folk I'm taking a right away from, which the old way was taking away from both lords and commoners. To be, you know, it was taking away from the entire culture. A good, it was a good thing to take away, but still, he was worried that they would go to war over it. And he's like, well, if I take this away from all these lords, will they go to war with me over it? He, he thought it was the lesser of two evils, I think, which is maybe hard to swallow, but I think that's it's, maybe his angle. It's still perplexing to me, because who is yeah. they? Like, yeah. let it, it, say this Lord Gargon, you know, Aegon takes us right away, and Lord Gargon's like, what? You can't do that. Call the banners. Every bannerman is going to be like, no. I'm not fighting not Balerion, coming. yeah. So, what did we just well, go not through? Not only are yeah. not fighting Balerion, you raped my wife. Yeah, I'm like, not fighting for you. Yeah. Like, who is going to go fight for this guy? Yeah, so. yeah. So again, it is a little perplexing, like, why they thought they had to keep that. I guess Aegon was just convinced of it somehow. or It's pretty bad, though, yeah. It, it, he, he, he was letting them keep something that was pretty awful. But apparently, but here's another angle to it. It, it was more, more, it wasn't such a horrible thing on Dragonstone. It was more of a, like a, a semi-revered tradition. So maybe that was in it. Maybe Aegon thought other people saw it that way too. And he was just blind or naive about it. I don't know. It's hard to, it's definitely hard to square, but maybe not impossible to square. But you don't, obviously don't have to agree with it. I certainly don't. I know you don't. <laughs> Who would really? Very few people would, I think. But my, my best attempt is it, it's something that existed in theory that no one really did. Hmm. Except this guy really did it. Yeah. And maybe many people were barely aware. It was brought to Aegon's attention, but it, with all the stuff in his plate, he didn't have time for it. I mean, I, th- these things don't exactly justify it, but they make me understand how it could happen. I, mm. I have a hard time understanding how this scenario existed. That's my best attempt to understand how the scenario, it yeah. doesn't make it okay, but I don't even understand how the scenario existed. So. Right. Now, Aegon may not have been worried about any of this, like you said, he's not worried about him changing the laws to a point that they're going to come at him and especially not defeat him. I don't think he's worried about that. It's also not really in his personality to be worried about that. He's not really a, someone who does, he doesn't act on fear. He, he inspires fear. He doesn't really act on it on his, on his own. Uh, so, but he had to keep his descendants in mind too. If we're looking at another angle here, he's like, well, they might not come after me for first night banning, but what if I die tomorrow and my eight-year-old son has to deal with this problem. That, that he's not going to be able to handle it. Even, even when 80s is older, it turns out he's not so capable of dealing with these problems. But he certainly wouldn't have been when, when he was still recovering from the death of his mother and wasn't even an adult yet. So Aegon had to keep that in mind. He's like, it's not, it's not just about what I can handle. It's what my descendants can handle. And, which maybe is an argument for him being the one to, to pull the bandage off so that he deals with it and not them, right? So I, I think maybe this is... Maybe he did this one backwards. Maybe he shouldn't have let it lie. Maybe he should have taken it head on while he, a strong personality, could deal with the fallout from it and not his descendants. Because his descendants, if he's being honest with himself, well, are my descendants really going to be as strong and capable as me? Well, they're going to be my children. Of course they are. But really, really, Aegon, are they really? Will they have a dragon as big as Balerion? Will they? Yeah, I don't know about that, man. You're pretty special. <laughs> so, I don't know. You wonder how the ego of a really powerful man works in that spot. Is, does his ego tell him that, no, no one will ever be as great as me? Or because they're his children, his descendants, does his ego you know, cover that base, too, and says, no, they're my children. They will be as great as me. Like, I don't know how that kind of, I don't know how to work pride into ego and the, the, the mind of someone with such supreme authority and uh someone who moves through life with such extreme privilege like that i don't know yeah, it's hard to put yourself in that head in that mind which is why probably part of why george doesn't give us a lot of insight into his personality because it would it is a hard thing to nail down i want to back up to one quick thing from sure. that quote uh where we started here where was it uh a lord should know the lands he rules, the conqueror told his son Aenys, da 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 da. Another value of him traveling around with his uh, court um, is not only that's what on the surface it seems to be saying, Mary, you gotta learn about the people that you're ruling. Just, you should know their traditions, their customs, the people in different positions of power. You, you need to be familiar with it all. But also, uh, 
he can size up their capabilities, mm, yeah. wh- whether it's for fear of having to quash a rebellion or for how to employ them. If, if we need to go to war with someone like these guys have good ships, these guys have good fishing technology. Mm. These guys have, you know, good, uh, you know, spearmen or whatever it is, you know, he could just see when, when all the places he go want to show off to him. Oh, now he knows what their different capabilities and values are and how to employ them. So, yeah, well said. Another mention by Gil Dane here that's important uh, coming from the quote here is that the laws of inheritance and succession remained unchanged. That's important to note because it's going to matter later, <laughs> soon and later, about within the Targaryen family themselves. Of course, a lot of the civil conflicts that come are about inheritance disputes and primacy disputes, who comes first and, and who who lines of succession, all that business. You know what I mean. And if we fast forward to the end of the Targaryen reign, Aerys II, you look at what was laid down here and what was falling apart then. It's not just the loss of dragons. It's not just the fact that Aerys was an insane person and Aegon wasn't. It's the fact that Aegon's policy was pretty clear. The first law of Westeros is peace. You go up against that, and you go up against the dragons. But Ares violated his end of the bargain. He went after them. He went after his lords. He ordered executions of people who didn't do anything wrong. So he violated the feudal contract in, in expunge. Like the tar- that's the, the heart of the feudal contract. I protect you. You give me money and soldiers. I enforce fair laws, you know, back and forth. It's a it's a little give and take. Obviously, one has authority over the other, but there is a deal that has to be upheld even by the greater power. And if that power is violated, then the lesser powers team up and go against that greater power, which is exactly what Robert's Rebellion was. The, the Targaryens betrayed their feudal oath and enough of their vassals teamed up to overthrow them. There you go. <laughs> Aegon didn't want that to happen. And to be fair, it didn't for 280 two-ish years, which is a pretty darn long time. <laughs> it's a pretty good length for a dynasty to go. All right. Uh, we'll come back in a minute with a few more points about Aegon. We've got a lot more to say. But I've been really having a great time with Magic Mind. It's been so much longer now. We've been talking about it for a few months now. And the whole point of it, as we've said, we've been saying from the beginning, the the more you're on it, the more it starts to matter, the more you notice. And we've also reviewed from a scientific perspective how some of these ingredients work that way like literally the longer you take them the more effect they have and that's true for a lot of herbs or pharmaceuticals or what have you and there's no pharmaceuticals here i'm just saying that's a a concept that's well familiar to uh to health and wellness it's also done uh, one thing that we've said for me personally has worked out really well as i said i would it's one of the benefits to magic mind is that it removes some of your desire to drink coffee i have definitely had less coffee these last last two months i have it almost as often but in smaller amounts a lot of times i would have a whole thermos and now i have just a cup and that's it's a pretty substantial difference and i don't feel and i've been getting more done i I can't credit all that to magic mind but definitely some of it has i have to give credit to and i think the less coffee is probably helping that too because i probably don't crash as often I do feel like I, when I read, a lot of times I get tired and or zone out. And I feel like that's been happening less. I've mm. been able to read longer and deeper without starting to zone out. So that's, that's pretty positive. Valuable. Yeah, yeah. And I'm definitely drinking less sodas. I've pointed that out a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, you have. That, that is really good. That is really, really good. I, I don't know how to exactly value that but it's valuable <laughs> you know what i mean it's like it's hard to quantify these things specifically but and these I, are all very good things and i've never been a coffee drinker so i notice a difference in just having a daily routine if i mix my little drink i do some magic wine with the juice that i like and i drink it as i start my day and start working which i think probably a lot of coffee drinkers could relate to that sort of routine i personally Absolutely. never have been able to i've never had a drink routine to start my day but I like it. It helps put me kind of in the zone, I feel. <laughs> yeah. It's the first thing I do. I have my shot of magic. It's like the first thing. I might have a cup of water first, but that little shot is like the first thing that goes in, in my stomach just about every day. If you want to start your day that way, go to magicmind.com slash Westeros. Get up to 56% off your subscription for the next 10 days with the code Westeros20. 
That's magicmind.com slash Westeros with the code Westeros20. Start focusing more, getting more out of your day, uh, drinking less coffee or soda. Our testimonials are a testament <laughs> to that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's probably going to have benefits for you too. So check it out, magicmind.com, Westeros, Westeros20. I have a question for, for you all, just kind of an idle question about Aegon. What, what do you think he was maybe the most proud of? There's obviously no way we could know. But was he most proud of having children? It's, he cried when his first granddaughter was born, we're the told size that, of which his is dragon. Kind, of a, kind of a hard thing to picture. What's that? The size of his dragon. The size of his dragon. <laughs> very proud of that. He didn't have anything to do with that himself, but he could be proud of it. <laughs> maybe King's Landing, maybe just the iron, maybe forging the realm together. Maybe he didn't have a thing dragon. he was most proud of. <laughs> Use a euphemism. <laughs> there's euphemisms, but there's also mephemisms. <laughs> I would say maybe King's Landing. I, I would. It is a good question, but I feel like King's Landing might be the thing. I would. I guess I might be more proud of it. If I had supposed early on, I, I think even before I read Fire and Blood, that he he might have had some intent for it that he might have done some scouting like his visits to other cities before he even declared uh that he was taking over the seven kingdoms that he might have been like talking to maesters and then looking at how cities are designed and kind of contemplating the idea of creating a new city and what it might take mm. but then there's this line in here that says no one planned king's land yeah oh, I go. Well, yeah man. well there you go if he did do that he's not getting credit for it so <laughs> may i I don't know how proud he would be if he didn't actively intend to d build that city up, but yeah, uh, it's something I would be proud of. It, it, it's it's something that thousands, millions of people would be benefiting from. You know, it's yeah. uh, in in in, in a, a more direct way, like indirectly, everyone at Seven Kingdoms is benefiting from the peace that he's brought. But there's still some people who are just running a farm. They just keep running a farm, and they don't know or care who the king of the land. They're is. glad that they're yeah. like they look back and go, you know what. I've had 20 years of, of uninterrupted. That's pretty good. You know, they might, it might be yeah. one of those things that the dawns on them that, you know what? I haven't had my, no one's come to my farm to <laughs> take my food in a long time. That's, that's pretty good. Maybe I give Aegon some credit for that. Do you think he was proud of the throne of his idea to make the Iron Throne? He it's was like, clever. yeah, this is metal. It's, as the, yeah. it's a very cool idea. I mean, if I'm George R. R. Martin, I'm proud of that idea. So yeah, Aegon the Conqueror <laughs> probably was too. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. I know I know a few people that were like, when they heard that, it was like, that's how the throne was made? They're like, okay, I got to read this series. Like, <laughs> 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 That's pretty sweet. Yeah, just that kind of cleverness. Yeah. Anthony De Palma sends a super chat, says, I do wonder if maybe the Blackwood Bracken feud started because a filthy Bracken tried first night on a Blackwood ally. <laughs> you never know. That could be. It is supposed to be a very ancient tradition. And the Bracken Blackwood feud is also very ancient. Yeah, you never know. I uh, wouldn't doubt it. Wouldn't uh, wouldn't throw that guess out. That's for sure. Dornish Dame, frequent commenter. We appreciate that. Dornish Dame says, building good relationships with non-Lords Paramount could be a warning to those Lords Paramount that they had had to stay loyal or be replaced. Kind of like the Stannis Solis marriage as a warning to the Tyrells. That's a great point because the whole Warden of the North, South, East, West and the very briefly existing Warden of the Sands, those are additional prestige ranks that people can uh, uh you know aspire to or yes could have taken away from and if you want to hold on to that better do right by the king better prove that you're worthy of that yeah and the, the tyrell's a good example tyrell's are wardens of the south but they better act right if they want to keep that <laughs> and joe magician says most proud of scribbling a dream into a dagger with ambiguous language <laughs> yeah like i'm gonna here's what i'll do i'm gonna i'm gonna scribble this on a dagger yeah that's what i'll do <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah he had a flair for the dramatic i'm gonna make an ancient i'm gonna make an artifact yeah a couple artifacts i'd say the throne is an artifact yeah that's true like if you're a king with with the supernatural legacy and you don't make artifacts like what is, what are you even doing you know come on you've got a dragon you got you should be making artifacts man you got all those jewels you got valyrian steel you got obsidian you got yeah it's like 
what was it the the bit about if you're a billionaire what are you doing not buying all the baseball teams and making them wear dresses you know why are you not <laughs> doing that like what is your problem <laughs> i agree though i really agree like what if if you're that rich and you don't just choose chaos on a daily <laughs> basis you're you're doing life wrong <laughs> So let's talk about the first law. The most basic tenet was simple enough. Quote. The first law of the land shall be the king's peace, King Aegon decreed. And any lord who goes to war without my leave shall be considered a rebel and an enemy of the Iron Throne. King Aegon also decrees regularized customs, duties, and taxes throughout the realm, whereas previously every port and every petty lord had free had been free to exact however much they could from tenants, small folk, and merchants. So and it's another rare direct quote from Aegon, uh, but this was most likely a statement he took proper care to word before uttering, because it's, it's the first law of the land. You don't want to be imprecise <laughs> with that, right? It's, it's a law. You, you t- these things tend to be worded carefully, even in settings that aren't our own. Especially in our own. I mean, dang, that's why there's so many lawyers, right? But uh, uh, standardizing taxes is a pretty important move. It's a, it's a bit of a departure from or an exception to his policy of leaving local traditions in place. Although it's arguable that, you know, fleecing people is a tradition. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a very important thing. This is a very pro commoner and, and pro like merchant type move that that takes powers away from from the lords uh, even more so than the powers of private war which we'll discuss in a minute in general pro stability yeah um like even the 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 lords are probably better off when their people can plan around how much they're going to be taxed yes that makes sense yes. like and that's probably part of why king's landing was able to grow so fast because everyone kind of knew what the expectations were. Everyone can make appropriate investments and not be worried that if I invest X in this, someone's just going to come take it all from me. So I'm not going to bother. But everyone knew it's just going to be 8% or whatever it was. And so they could invest and plan accordingly. Yeah, that's a great point. I think to add to that, I think King's Landing was the place that change was happening. King's Landing was the spearhead of change. And the other cities around the realm would have had to kind of pick up after it, even though it wasn't as large as them yet or became as large as some of them during this phase because those tradi- the, as soon as Aegon makes a decree it's going to start locally first of course it takes a while for it to travel around the realm this is not the internet era obviously and uh, let's talk about private wars this is a big deal it's a very big deal this the sort of right to private war was a problem in the real world as well it's a, a huge problem amongst various kingdoms and whether or not the lords within that kingdom had this right or not the 15th century diet of worms for the Holy Roman Empire banned feuds amongst its various princes. It's, a, it's at the beginning of the Accursed King series. That's a beloved favorite of George R. R. Martin and also a big favorite of mine and Nina, who wrote this particular note. When the Iron King, Philip the Handsome, took over, he really reformed French nobility. And that was the, one of the things he took away was the right of private war. And it's such a big deal. These private wars were just a horrible thing. They just at any moment, two great houses could go to war with each other, and it would spill over into neighboring counties, and the the pop, local population would be just shredded or brought into it, or both. Like, finally, a king was powerful enough to stop that. Because of course, remember what we just said about the feudal system. If the if the lesser lords could all gang up on the king, then the king is limited in what he can do. And this is one of those things where like, no, you can't take away our right to private war. Most of the kings prior to Philip, had they tried to take that right away, they would have gotten ganged up on and overthrown. But Philip was in a position both powerful enough and had enough control and enough money to say, come at me. You guys want to stop me changing the law? We'll fight over it. And they were afraid of him because, well, his nickname was the Iron King. <laughs> so you know, he didn't just he didn't just give himself that nickname. This guy was a serious boss. But just like Aegon, could that change hold after his death or could people get away with it in certain cases like exceptions? Well, maybe I could have my own little private war and the king will allow it because I'm so powerful and he won't be able to stop. Things like that. In in Aegon's case here, too, if 
it's understandable there might be times when two neighbors, you know, someone burns someone's house down or rapes someone's daughter or whatever it is that you would see why they might want to go to war. Yeah. But it, sometimes the reason might not be justified or the, the common people who get involved shouldn't be subject to the vengeance of these two lords or whatever. But the, but the idea that the lords feel like they need to do something. Well, if you go to Aegon, well, he'll do something. He's got a freaking dragon. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Like, and probably Aegon probably only has to do something a couple times before there's less re- people aren't as willing to, uh, to to infringe on their neighbor's rights because they're worried Aegon will get involved and they'll get in trouble for it, right? So, so sometimes when someone's just a bully or has more soldiers or whatever, they could push around their neighbors. But now if Aegon's going to intervene they're not even going to do it in the first place. Yeah, so that's a, well another thing that if he institutes this well enough in the beginning, it might not need as much enforcement in the long run. Well said, yes, or well point, Sean, very good. I think also this is very important in a Game of Thrones. Notice how Tywin does this. He doesn't openly send Gregor Clegane to raid the Riverlands by de- declaration. Everyone knows he sent Gregor, just like pretty much everyone knows he sent Gregor to kill Elia, even though he claims, I, I didn't do I didn't do that, you know. So when Ned calls Tywin out for raiding the Riverlands, everyone's like, but Tysol's like, but he didn't do it. It was Gregor. And then Ned's like, come on, man. We know who sent him. He says, Ned says, Tywin has to answer for his crimes and breaking the king's peace. This is this is private war. He's engaging in private war, which is expressly illegal. And Tywin knows it's illegal, which is why he doesn't he sends someone else to do it and never and, and has Gregor not show his banner and all these other sort of sneaky, but not that sneaky things like we know what's happening. But he's Tywin's trying to give himself an out or give himself cover and also he's tywin who robert wouldn't want to go up against so he's like look i covered my ass this should be enough for you to let me get away with this you know yeah. politically speaking do you really want to go to war with castly rock ned's like yeah because that's what the law says that's ned for you right he, he doesn't have that flexibility <laughs> within the law like a lot of people would he's like ned's like if this causes civil war so be it that's the law pycelle yes is a lannister toady but he's also kind of like maybe we shouldn't go to war, you know, maybe just give him, maybe back down a little bit, Ned. And Ned's like, nope, <laughs> nope. He broke the king's peace. That's the first law of the land. He doesn't say ever since Aegon the Conqueror, it's been the law, the first law of the land, but it, but it has been like, Ned didn't say that, but it is the case. It's hard to know how things would play out. Cause I don't, I, I want to believe Ned wouldn't be completely rigid because Tywin has to want to go to war against the king now, mm-hmm. right? Which he might back so down So is on. Tywin really going to do that? Yeah. So they might have found a compromise if Tywin said, okay, you know, Gregor, come back. You guys can penalize Gregor in some way. I'll pay reparations. They like it. There, I think there is some middle ground b- between the Lanners to go into war with the Crown, Winterfell. I, I don't know how it would have played out. But I, I think that... Ned would have been willing to negotiate. It wasn't like war or nothing for Ned. Just like I don't think it was war or nothing for Tywin either. I think you're right. I think that's very well said because I think what Ned was doing, yes, it looks a little obstinate, but he's also sort of calling Tywin's bluff. And he's doing exactly what you just said. Tywin's saying, you don't want to fight me, do you? And Ned's saying, no, you don't want to fight me, do you? (laughs) And he's like, well, yeah. Like, actually, neither of us want to fight each other. Yeah, that's and that yeah, might be so where Ned's not going to let him get away with it, but he doesn't necessarily want war. He doesn't want to be so. bullied around. He's like, well, we can't let Tywin push yeah. us around, but he can't, we he can't let this precedent be established. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so is this a standard thing? Meaning Aegon's approach to be chiefly concerned with peace like that, to be so uh, consumed with enforcing the peace that maybe it causes or sets the stage for war later, maybe in the next reign or a little farther down the road. Like, for example, look at look at the Roman Empire. It's kind of a thing that's said about the Roman Empire that the Romans would kill everyone and call it peace <laughs> because, <laughs> well, there's no war, but there's nobody at all. Like you killed all the people in this region and that's how you dealt with the, the uprising here is, well, there's nobody here at all. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that's what Aegon would do. Well, he might. He, do, he did do that in Dorne. So he he is capable of doing that. He's fully capable of doing that. He doesn't. It's not his first choice. But 
what I'm asking a, a bigger question that I don't fully expect an answer to. This is something for you all to ponder on your own, perhaps. Yeah. How often historically in the real world and maybe in Westeros is, is this is this carried forward? Do other monarchs prioritize this as heavily as Aegon did? And do they do so because Aegon did or because they also see the same logic in it that he does? Is it just kind of a standard? Well, of course, peace has to be number one, you know. But it's, it's, there's a difference between peace is number one and how you get there, right? There's the whole soft peace versus hard peace that I discussed before. There's the the peace of the of killing everybody that I just described from the Romans. And there's the, a, an actual quality peace where there's you're not killing lots of people and everyone's actually getting along and society's doing pretty well. That's the the real goal, right? Of that's like that's a good peace. And how does it relate to the prophecy, if at all? Does, is Aegon chiefly concerned with, like, well, okay, I just need stability. That's what the prophecy tells me. Does it stability at, at any cost for when this comes, whenever this, this evil, whenever this winter descends upon the realm, whenever that's going to be, whether it's in a few years or in 100 years or 200 years. As it turned out, it's about 300 years. But <laughs> what exactly are the dictates of the prophecy within his mind? It's, it, it doesn't have to be straightforward. It's a prophecy. It can be like, the the suns must be aligned. Well, does he mean, is it suns like the suns in the sky or the suns like my children? You know, prophecy's weird like that, right? It's a dream. He's not going to wake up with exact, precise details. And it's not like he has a schematic or a blueprint to go from or even writings. And if they are writings, then they're his own writings probably that he scribbled down, you know, after waking up or something. So, hmm. Tricky. Not a question we can answer, but worth asking, worth throwing out there. And as we discuss things like the supernatural, well, it's a good segue, a good pivot to matters of the faith, matters of the, the faith of the seven. There's the laws of the various kingdoms, but the laws of the customs of the faith of the seven are different. And they span geographical and political borders and have to be dealt with separately. So let's have a quote on that. He also proclaimed that the holy men and women of the faith and all their lands and possessions were to be exempt from taxation and affirmed the right of the faith's own courts to try and sentence any septon, sworn brother, or holy sister accused of malfeasance. Though not himself a godly man, the first Targaryen king always took care to court the support of the faith and the High Septon of Old Town. Oh boy, this seems maybe like not a big deal, but it's a very big deal, both in world and IRL. Uh, giving holy people a different court system was a key issue in the time of Henry I, who was the father of the first Plantagenet king, the dynasty that is the closest parallel to the Targaryens. They lasted for 300 years. They ruled England, which is, you know, kind of like Westeros. And of course, uh, the Plantagenet, House of Plantagenet eventually features the cadet branches York, a.k.a. Stark, and Lancaster, a.k.a. Lannister, while also including the Angevin dynasty. Henry I was also the fourth son of the biggest Aegon the Conqueror parallel, William the Conqueror, so all sorts of parallels here. Now, Henry I, in his time, same thing happened. They had different laws for the church and for regular folk, and this became a problem because ch church people started to learn that they could really abuse this, like a bishop could do all sorts of awful crimes and then they wouldn't have to face murder charges or rape charges or extortion. They would just get like kicked out of the faith. That would be the penalty. And Henry's like, that's not enough penalty. And the church who are devout believers in God and think that it's all about that are like, what could be worse than being kicked out of the church? You know, what's worse than that? You know, and it was like, well, actually a lot of things really, if you aren't as devout as you, you know. <laughs> Let me show you. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and another problem was laws weren't written down. They were, the king decided the interpretation. He's like, well, because that because then you can't get around them. Like, you could use legalese. You could, you could use the detail of wording and be like, technically, semantically, this says this. It, it allows an exception. There's a carve out here because of the way it's worded. So if you have a king that doesn't write things down, the king can't go, nah, that's not an exception. I make the call. The law as intended shouldn't allow things like what you're describing. Yes, that the way it's worded, you should be allowed to do that, but I'm the king and I say no. Ah, no. 
the world we live in, these exceptions work. Like you go to court, you go to like the way it's worded often is the final an ar- arbiter of how it works. Henry realized that. He's like, no, I don't want to write things down because it's exactly what it's going to lead to. Legalese, arguing over semantics, and the spirit of the law being ignored for the letter of the law. He thinks the spirit of the law should matter more. So it was a double, double-edged double sword here. A, it's the, the church started to get corrupt in that they wouldn't give, quote-unquote, real punishments to people that did severe, awful crimes. And because... The way the laws could be interpreted allowed too much room to wiggle free from them. So there's too many ways to get out from under the law. And it sounds like, unfortunately, Aegon set things up a little similarly, minus the part about him having... He was more powerful than the Church of England was. Like Aegon's relative power over the High Septon is greater than Henry's power over the Pope. But it's still very powerful. They're still very powerful, and Aegon had to tread carefully, as it shows here. He was... It says he was careful with all of them. Uh, six different high septons reigned during his time. Like the ele- the one that was crowned in 11 AC passed. Uh, or rather, the one who crowned Aegon f- in his coronation passed in 11 AC. And there were six more after that. And Aegon just kept being nice to them. He didn't resolve any of the problems. He didn't deal with the incest or the polygamy, things that the church doesn't accept. He just kind of like, well, we're friends, right? We're not, you're not going to bring that up. Well, of course they did eventually after his death. So yeah, so this is maybe the best example of Aegon just kicking the can down the road and not dealing with a problem that was definitely going to be foisted on his descendants. Especially because he's the one that's going to arrange for the marriages of his sons and all that. Like He's in charge of all that. And, and some of the choices made therein are part of the problem that he could have maybe headed off ahead of time. Like, yeah, polygamy. Like they, the, the polygamy issue kind of became moot because Rainey's died. So he wasn't really married to two people anymore. But, but they never accepted the double marriage. They never publicly said this marriage is okay by us. And it could have become up. It didn't, but it could have come up like, well, okay, well, if the double marriage isn't okay, then which marriage was valid? How do you choose? And if you're choosing one marriage over the other, does that put one prince over the other in a way that it wasn't before? Like, if you choose Visenya, does that mean Magor comes over Aenys? Yikes. That's a whole ball of wax that no one wants to get involved in. So you can see why they didn't go there. But then you have the incest marriages, too. So it's also an incest marriage. If they're not okay with either marriage... So how do you pick one over the other? How do you allow it when incest marriages aren't permitted? And how do you deal with the, with the succession with all that mixed in? Like, Aegon married them both at the same time. It was one ceremony, so you can't even use, like, timing as an order. Well, who did he kiss first? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, which one did he hand his, the ring to first? Like, who? Uh, they're going to get, speaking of getting technical with the legalese, right? Well, you kiss Maybe them. they did all that simultaneously, Yeah, too. it was a three-way yeah, kiss. in each hand yeah. and, like... Put it on your fingers at the same time. <laughs> it'll kiss right together at the same moment. That's clever, yeah. That's right. So so he didn't rock the boat, but the waves were coming, right? This is this was an issue that big waves, I think. So what do you think, Sean? And, and maybe, Shay, if you care to weigh in, do you think this is the most obvious, like, problem that he just left for someone else? Or, or is maybe there more to it? Am I missing something? Well, for one, like I said earlier, is that – to deal with this problem might have created other problems and yeah. he just had to pick his battles and it may be he's kicking us down a road but if he dealt with this problem he might have been kicking some other problem down a road like a general rebellion you know like the, getting in trouble with the church is harder to deal with because it's it's kind of like dorn it's not like one castle or one lord you can go burn down and everyone's like okay we'll obey you now it's people scattered all across everywhere mm-hmm. so I can see him just not quite being sure how to do it or worrying about creating a bigger problem. And, it, you know, I, I guess that's sort of kicking the can down the road, but I think it's better than like planting a time bomb down or, or okay. like starting a fire right now or what, I don't know what the yeah. analogy is, but you see what I'm saying, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I'm brought back to what I said earlier, which is it's a gamble to say that it'll be easier for the next generation to deal with. But I think it's a reasonable gamble to make. That you're you're kicking it down the road for someone that's going to be a five difficulty to deal with potentially, and for you it's like a nine. They might be, yeah. They might have more. Ability. It might yeah, still it might be, be a seven still, but I don't think mm-hmm. it's going to be harder. I don't like. I think that's a pretty reasonable guess that it won't. 
necessarily be much harder. They won't be more entrenched. They won't be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As it turned out, they did become more entrenched, but that's <laughs> because of the actions of people like Magor and not necessarily because of just the way things, things it would have been hard for for yeah. uh Aegon to predict and things yes. could have gone another way right. like so. his own family is responsible is, is a big role in making it worse he didn't necessarily see that coming maybe he should have because he should he would have should again he should have seen these rubs like this incest polygamy issue is gonna matter it's gonna come to a head it's it's not addressed so yeah so uh, yeah I, but i see what y'all are saying it's fair to think that maybe he guessed it was the lesser of two easel a better way to handle it is to let a little time pass let people maybe get more used to this and then maybe address it later and especially again when you consider it's not as simple as this or that it's not like instead of dealing with the church i'm gonna go party right? <laughs> yeah, like instead the of dealing with the church <laughs> i need to go visit winterfell right yeah. he had he was doing other responsible difficult things through the course of his whole reign and one of those would have been sacrificed in order to deal with the church so yeah. even if he found a way to deal with the church that didn't create a bigger problem down the road he might have been neglecting some other thing that would have become a bigger problem down the road or Im immediately yeah so and Nina points out a really something really useful and helpful and insightful that I didn't think of, is, which is that the faith was actually given a boon here. Aegon's conquest, in a lot of ways, benefited the faith. Like, it solidified the official religion of the Seven Kingdoms, which was more of an uh, unofficial by, by weight of its popularity. Now it was like official, the state religion, in a sense. Like, Aegon accepted the other religions, but it wasn't like the state religion. It wasn't the one he was crowned under. Like, he didn't go... He was he accepted the crowning at the at Old Town, you know, at the high at the Sept, the Great Sept or whatever. But he didn't he didn't recrown himself in Winterfell and in Pike under the other gods. Right. He just that was kind of just ex assumed to be part of the whole package, I guess. So the faith had more room to operate maybe under Aegon. They might have had an easier time, like collecting their taxes and establishing chapter houses of the sons of the warrior and all that so there were a lot of institutional benefits to the faith being sort of grandfathered in under Aegon's conquest like their profile was raised in a lot of ways especially given Aegon was going to allow them to do their own laws separately that did eventually change and that caused more problems but it certainly, in the short term, it certainly was like, well, yeah, why should we go up against this guy? He's actually, yes, we hate the polygamy, we hate the incest, but we're getting lots of money and power. <laughs> so, which is, makes sense, because in the long run, it's the common folk that really get uppity about it. Like, the nobility get more and more corrupt with vis-a-vis -vis the seven and the tenets of the faith, whereas it's the common folk who are the hardcore, like, no, we obey these rules. We obey these rules that you laid out. And now we see you not obeying them. And we're just going to obey them even even harder, <laughs> which is going to put us at, at more and more at odds, which is going to be a big problem under Aenys and Magor's reigns. You know, I also want to point out that, that uh, I don't know, decree Aegon made about the court being able to manage itself, basically. You could argue that's part of him not kicking it down the road. He is sort of addressing his problem. By doing that, they were at least temporarily okay, and maybe that's sort of kicking it down the road, but it is an attempt to address this issue. He didn't just totally ignore it, right? Yeah. That was sort of a maybe a compromise. It maybe was even discussed with leaders of the church to come to that because he knew that they were upset about the polygamy thing. He was like, how about this? Yes. You know, um, and like Shea was saying, like, once you do that, Maybe farther down the road, it gets easier to deal with it. Maybe both the people of the land and the church itself gets more used to it. Like the, it's such this blasphemous idea to marry your sister or marry two women or whatever. But maybe the, when you see that the people that did this brought peace to the land and gave autonomy to the church and they're doing all these positive things like, oh, maybe it's not as bad as we always thought, you know, and the more time it has to become normalized, the less of an issue it is down the road to deal with one way or the other. So, yeah, well said. Yeah, that's it, that's uh, it's it's interesting to, to look at. Usually we don't see such big divides amongst belief like that. But it's, a, it's also something that happens in the real world. L there's a quote here that gets us even further on this subtopic. So let's have that here. Yet the question of incestuous marriage remained. 
simmering below the courtesies like poison. Whilst the high septon of King Aegon's reign never spoke out against the king's marriage to his sisters, neither did they declare it to be lawful. The humbler members of the face, village septons, holy sisters, begging brothers. Sean, will you say that again? You said face. Okay, sorry. The humbler members of the faith, village septons, holy sisters, begging brothers, poor fellows, still believed it sinful for brother to lie with sister or for a man to take two wives. Aegon the Conqueror had further... Aegon the Conqueror had fathered no daughters, however, so these matters did not come to a head at once. The sons of the dragon had no sisters to marry, so each of them was forced to seek elsewhere for a bride. So circumstances kicked that particular can down the road there. It just didn't come up. There were no incestuous marriages proposed in the short term. Later, that did happen, and it was a problem. And by that, I mean Visenya proposed marrying Megor to Reyna, and that was rejected by pretty much everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of, perhaps most of the nobility adhere to the faith because it gives them power over the commoners and otherwise believe less in the doctrines than they say they do. They uphold that because it gives them power over the masses. Kind of like the real world. And, okay, of course, there's exceptions. There are lords who are very devout, very much believers, who have strong faith also in the real world. But it's definitely not always as it seems. You know, take that with a grain of salt. And maybe there's... Uh, Nina makes a point that maybe there's a little too much extremism in Westeros, that maybe there aren't enough moderate believers as people who seem to be very into it and people who aren't in it at all in terms of their worship mm, maybe that's true I, I haven't thought about that it's an interesting point to make she uses catalyst in his example as someone that is kind of in between a middle ground person who has is devout enough to pray but maybe not every day she does certainly prays when she's worried about something <laughs> and the, they these commoners that are held the power held over them is because the commoners often do sincerely believe in these doctrines because they were taught to for the nobility. It's like a guide to holding power that you might choose to believe in also, but it's taught to more common folk. Like, yeah, this is how the, this is how the universe works. These gods are real. And if you don't do what they say, you'll go to the seven hells uh, or whatever, or you'll just be ostracized or something like that. So, yeah, when things come to a head, when the nobility's, like, desire to gain power is at odds with their ability to show that they care about the faith. So when, when these things come to a head in a way that they can't hide, and they have to openly choose, actually, I don't really care about incest and polygamy. <laughs> And people can see that. They're like, wait, you're supposed to care about incest and polygamy. Like, you, you've you been teaching me my whole life that that matters. And now you don't care about it because you're getting paid? Yeah, so that you can see why that would cause unrest when it's multiplied by hundreds of thousands of commoners. And, but it, it's still the, the full fear doctrine still rules. I mean, who wants to be recognized as a ringleader of, upst of un malcontents when Visenya exists, right? You don't want to be, you don't want to be like singled out as the ringleader of, a, of malcontents. Like she will not treat that kindly. Uh, but zealots, people who only fear punishment in the afterlife, even Visenya doesn't really intimidate them. You know, zealots and people that, I mean, we're going to see people literally take on dragons, like face-to-face -face humans. And it's it sounds crazy, but, I mean, we live in a world where people fly planes into buildings and ships on purpose. So it's not that hard to believe that fictional people could, <laughs> could <laughs> die for a cause that's, you know, un intangible. So they're fair game, you know. Not so much during Aegon's reign, though, because, again, uh, the, this issue was kicked down the road like a can because there were no Targaryen princesses. The incest and polygamy stuff was uh, delayed. But he had to see it coming. Again, Aegon had to see this coming. He's like, what? My descendants will never have incestuous marriages again. He didn't make some law against it. He didn't tell them not to do that. So it, it was clearly going to come up again. Maybe he counseled Aenys on how to handle it, and it just wasn't recorded. It was behind closed doors. Maybe Aenys just bungled it. He was like, my dad told me what to do, but I screwed it up. Um, but 
He did a lot. Let's not be let's be clear that Aegon did a lot to facilitate the faithful. He built seps, all those trips to Old Town, granting protections. Uh he had Aenys marry his cousin and Magor marry a high tower, which that was sort of um, a bone to the faith there, having one of his sons marry into the house most closely aligned with the faith. Didn't have any, didn't allow any polygamous and incestuous marriages to happen. They did happen later, but not under his watch. So, and Nina reminds us, like, what's he going to do to start changing the faith doctrines like yeah he's the king he's the conqueror but that's still i mean goes to show there's limits to even his power like i think a lot of you would 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 hear that and go yeah that would be hard to do even though you might be thinking but he's got supreme power we all know how hard it is to change church anything (laughs) in the real world it's the type of thing like say he did through force or negotiation or whatever get the leaders the the high septon or whatever to change the actual wording of their religion to say it's okay yeah does that mean that every person in the land i was like oh i guess it's okay now like the catholic church at this point has conceded that they misjudge galileo or whatever that evolution yeah. is is not opposed to their beliefs in god that the sun is the center of the souls all this other stuff but there's still people who don't believe that there's mm. still people who don't even when the pope says something every catholic doesn't immediately believe those things so. i agree and we'll see that it is it's going to come to jaharis and alisand to make these changes and they're going to do it in a clever and smart way clever and smart in, in a way that's effective but they are going to basically have to change some rules maybe more like adding rules rather than changing them which is better probably 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 a little easier way to manage it but yeah it's i mean the the reason that there's so many versions of so many major religions and other religions like let's use christianity as an example there's thousands of versions of it is because of rules changes a lot of it someone changed a rule and some people were like no we don't like that rule change we're doing it our own way or they changed it a different way and became a different version a different sect etc you know and yeah like i said that that applies to pretty much every religion that's ever existed <laughs> there's been versions of it and people disagreeing over what the rule should be that's the problem when you don't have a central authority like unless god comes down and tells you what the rules are which people have claimed has happened <laughs> and, and you know, all, for all i know maybe it did uh i would guess it didn't but what do i know so <laughs> and then people argue over that really happened or not or yeah like what they meant by what, what they, they said. Meant. Did you really interpret yeah. God correctly? Was that, are you sure that was God? You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's really interesting how much of this stuff is very much what happened in the real world. And then some of it still happens today. The way like we deal with religion and politics, the way those two things intersect or religion and culture. And even now we have to be careful with what we say to religious leaders or religious people <laughs> about on certain topics, right? Like, Yes, whether you're powerful or whether you're a regular everyday person like me, yeah, it's true. As for Magor, by the way, I mean, Magor, the guy who's going to, we're going to spend a lot more time on later, the guy who's going to have the biggest problem with the faith of anybody, he's already showing red flags in his personality and extreme prowess. Age eight, he's already a squire. I mean, wow. And he may have already killed a cat and a horse just because he could. Uh, We're not sure about that. He may have also stabbed a stable boy who reacted to him stabbing the horse. This is the year 20, by the way. So it's, it's still well before the end of Aegon's reign. And that's another thing I maybe criticize Aegon for. Magor had a lot of red flags. I don't see a single bit of evidence Aegon did a darn thing about that. He's just like, well, yep, this kid of mine will inflict himself on the, re- on the re- realm. And that's, they'll just have to deal with that, you know. Did he not see his brother, his son, as a threat to his other son? I guess not, but... Hmm. He may have just not seen his son. He was he didn't... off traveling around right. and in meetings and all this stuff. And, like, again, you know, that's kind of sad and maybe a failure. But say he had spent more time with his son and his son grew up to be a better leader, right? But say because of that... His son now is dealing with a rebellion in the north because Aegon never got the north under control or whatever. You see, like something is always happening instead of something else. And it's hard for him to take on so much and be perfect at all of it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well said. Yeah, and and it's hard to disagree with that. I think you're right. And, And also, it's worth noting that some of these red flags when a kid is eight might not have panned out the way you think. Like, Aenys 
thought everyone thought he was going to be feeble. Oh, maybe not after all. Right. Like it, th- th- there were like rumors about him even being Aegon's son at first. But yeah. then he grew up a little bit and seemed more normal. Well, maybe that would have happened to Magor too. But it, it didn't. But you could see why Aegon maybe blew it off. So Yeah. Uh, or maybe Aegon tried in ways that no one saw or talked about and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. That's another possibility. So. That is true. Magor got Dark Sister around age 25 when he was 13 years old. So another five years after this last uh, note about um, him becoming a squire. He had already had uh, Gawain Corbray, who was probably the wielder of Lady Forlorn, the Valyrian steel blade that, that belongs to House Corbray. He was master at arms, chosen by Visenya to Magor. It may have graded on Magor and, and Visenya as well that the less martial prince, Aenys, was the one getting personal training from Aegon and the Kingsguard, who was always on all these royal progresses and getting all this attention. A lot of, like, a lot of the things that can arise, the problems that can arise with the second son getting pushed to the side and getting ignored. It's a particularly bad set of scenario, a bad scenario here because you have a, a character who's pretty paranoid, pretty prideful, a mother who's the same, and maybe an extreme version of everything going to the first son and, and the second son getting kind of left out of it. And those elements combining to create a big problem. You know, pride and being left out and the ability to do something about it. Because Magor is a, a really strong warrior and it's going to be looking on his brother like some weakling, you know. And yeah. And not a lot of people around to keep him in check either. Correct. Right? And Visenya probably encouraging him. Like she the kind of personality she had, hardliner, hardcore, you know, ambitious. Uh might makes right ruthless. Kind of mentality. Yes. Rule by fear bit. Very interesting person, but <laughs> but hard but very <laughs> but hard but not to be taken lightly. Highly relevant too is the notion that Visenya was on Dragonstone a lot. So she was not running King's Landing anymore. She had been for a while. And that seems to have been given more over to the hands of the king. Now, she's eventually going to return to King's Landing. But when she does, Aegon moves back to Dragonstone. So it's kind of suspicious that it's like he's keeping her away. What happens is, this is a little bit of a jump forward, is that Aegon's going to get, he's going to decide that the Aegon Fort is too pitiful. It's wooden. He's like, this is no proper seat for the king. So he's going to order it torn down and the Red Keep's going to be built in its place. Of course, the Red Keep will not be finished by the time he dies. But the process of building the Red Keep, he's going to hand over to Visenya and hand to the king, uh, Alan Stokeworth, I think is the name. And while he goes back to Dragonstone, because he's no longer got a place to live, because he just had his place mm-hmm. torn down. So, yeah, <laughs> which we'll come back to that to discuss the the building of the Red Keep and all that as a separate topic. But in terms of this topic, it just goes to show how it really seems like Magor and Visenya were really not with Aegon a lot. And maybe that goes back to why he spent so much time with Rhaenys. It wasn't just that he liked Rhaenys more. He might not have liked Visenya that much at all. Like, this is the woman that you know slashed him in the face when she dis- he disagreed with her. She was probably right, although maybe not to, to slash him in the face. She was right about the Kingsguard that he needed. Every time you're right, it doesn't mean you get to attack someone violently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, this is just the kind of personality she has. Like, she's not slashing him in the face left and right, but this is the kind of, like, attitude, the kind of, like, personality she has. She's like, no, I'm right, and I'm going to do what it takes to prove I'm right. I'm going to argue with you. We're going we're gonna to have conflict over this until it's resolved one way or another. I'm not going to back down. I'm not soft, you know? So, uh, maybe it didn't bother her that much that she was left out, but she was still very powerful, very dominant. And maybe it did bother her. Maybe, and it maybe bothered her son, too. So who are the usual suspects of this era? Who are the big houses at this time? It's not the same houses that it is uh, during A Song of Ice and Fire, although there is certainly a lot of overlap, right? I mean, the Lannisters are powerful then and now. But the Lannisters were not amongst the houses trying to ingratiate themselves with the Targaryens. They were not trying to get in good. They were not sending a lot of people to court. They were not trying to get favors and this. They were too proud to do that. So again, we see the, the different faces of pride. You can... Be the proud type that tries to outdo everybody else in winning the king's favor or too proud to even do that in the first place. Like, I don't need his acclaim. You know, my, you know, it's just, just the same coin, but different different approaches. To be fair, they were also physically farther away. Mm-hmm. And now then pride aside, maybe really didn't need the favors. They were wealthy and powerful. They were going to 
what are you going to do for us anyway? You know, it's like, a, even if someone had been in charge, it wasn't prideful. They still might not have been butting up as much as you, as others would be. Yeah. And some just maybe didn't have the chance. They maybe weren't allowed or there's too much else going on in their own area. Like the Ironborn. You don't hear about a lot of Ironborn at court at any era, really. Uh, and again, too far away. Very far away. You're right. Different religion, different cultural issues, maybe. Some just didn't want to because they were mad like the Starks. Like the Stark sons weren't a god to like go there on purpose. They might have, you know, been forced to or something, but it doesn't sound like that happened. The Manderleys, as we said before, they might be all for it. They might be like ready to find an opportunity there. And they did. There are a lot of Manderley Targaryen connections later. There was even going to be a marriage that didn't actually happen, but it was planned uh, before the bride died. So there's a lot going on there. That was a major connection. Stark Targaryen didn't go so great early on, but Manderly Targaryen did and held for a long time. Ve the Vale cozied up pretty nicely, as, we as we've discussed during the Dance of the Dragons era. A lot of connections between House Aaron and House Targaryen. I mean, Viserys' wife was half Aaron, and they had had a marriage. That was because of a, pr a prior marriage. And the Tyrells and Tullys were grateful for their rise in esteem but the Tyrells were a little occupied they were trying to establish themselves as the new rulers of the reach a lot of houses weren't happy about that plus and maybe a bigger factor they suffered huge losses in the first Ornish war just massive losses they had a lot to deal with they might have had they may have struggled a bit with the harvest because of all the loss of manpower right I don't know but it wouldn't have been easy they were definitely things that needed management the High Towers, as we know, they made all sorts of plays to getting good with the Targaryens through this faith, through marriage. Cerise High Tower is a big one. They had made marriage offers before that. The whole not participating in the Field of Fire thing with the we had a prophecy that said, you know, don't do that. Yeah, so there's a, they were they were making moves well ahead. They were maybe the most ahead of the game in terms of getting in good with the Targaryens, and that goes to show how far back some of these seeds were planted. Right, the High Towers. That truly came to a head in the Dance of the Dragons, but it started back in this era. So you have these factions burgeoning within the Tar ha Targaryen household, the Aenys and Magor factions, the two sp the split princes there. And different great, but one step down houses were associated with them in various ways, like Baratheon, Celtigar, and Valarian. Baratheon particularly notable because of the immediate blood relation, but Celtigar and Valarian were also valyrian origin so there's that by this time lord Ori's had what seems to be three sons with argella durandon and it's a kind of a rare case where we know the name of the second and third son but not the first one the one who who things continued through <laughs> that's kind of unusual but we know the name of of who it continued through of, of the firstborn son of that unnamed first son of Oris, because Oris's first grandson was Rogar Baratheon, born in 17 AC, and Rogar is a big name. Huge name. P presumably, he, he was uh, going to go on to be Lord Baratheon, of course, Lord of Storm's End. He's going to be Hand of the King, and yeah, we're, we're going to have plenty to say about him. Unfortunately, we don't hear anything more about Argella, even though she was such a big personality in that moment where she was captured. Yeah, we hear we hear nothing. But clearly, she's having she had children, so there's that. Uh, Alton Celtigar was important. He was the hand since nine A.C. and had been master of coin before that. He died in seventeen A.C. So the same year Rogar was born, uh, there was a hand a change at hand. I remember, Ori resigned as soon as he came back to King's Landing after being in captivity at the hands of the Widow Lover. So we had, again, real quick, Ori's Baratheon hand from 1 to 7, Edmund Tully hand from 7 to 9, Alton Celtigar hand from 9 to 17, and now Osmond Strong takes over. And Osmond Strong is going to be in charge until about 35 AC, at which place, at which time he'll be replaced by Alan Soakworth. Now, Osmond Strong is interesting because he is hand for so long, and he is the hand for the longest during Aegon's time, and he has the most to do with a lot of these building projects. And speaking of those building projects, we had originally planned on discussing the continuing story of King's Landing today, but we had such robust discussions today. We got so deep in these rabbit holes that we don't quite have time for that. So we'll save it for another time. King's Landing maybe is best handled 
as a standalone episode someday anyway. But regardless, we'll be coming back to talk about it, how it grows and bustles and how important that is and how the need for greater protection and the creation of walls and other things about it. It's, it's pretty darn interesting. And there's more to it than just building walls. There's a, there's a sortie. There's a mission to the Stepstones. Yeah. So we've got a lot more coming, folks. This is good times. It's a good time to be a fan of History of Westeros podcast. We call this sort of the, it's like the doldrums. It's still the, it's still super fun, but it's a, it's the longest time out bef- between like a TV, a new TV show. Like we know two are coming, but it's been a year and a half since House of the Dragon. And that means we have fewer listeners at this period. It's, it's a real ebb and flow. It's very seasonal. And I don't mean like winter, spring, summer, and fall. It's like, when things are happening in the fandom, there's more of you listening to us. And it's, yeah, it comes and goes. So we, we appreciate those of you who are here, even when things are at their lightest. We still have, just our enthusiasm is the same. We have the same level of fun. But, you know, it is nice to see those of you who are, are here, even in the uh, most hardcore times, when we get the deepest of our topics, some of the most nerdy subject matter, some of the most in the weed stuff. It's someone we have some of our best discussions, right? I mean, it's, it's when we get at topics that are hard to get at. It's hard to, we don't always have answers. You know, some of these things are about human nature and, and politics and, and belief, things that we never have truth about. We only can do our best. And when we do get new material from a show or the book or whatever, we'll have a lot more insight and preparation going into it. That's true. Yeah. But we will certainly keep them coming. We will... Next time, regale you with tales of the first royal house of the dragon, because I have long argued that Balerion was one of the main reasons for the conquest. Without such a particularly mighty dragon, the ambition might not have been so lofty, or the success might not have been so lofty. But clearly it wasn't all about Balerion, because as we'll see with this first royal house of the dragon, and as you may already know, the minute Aegon the Conqueror dies, the realm erupts in a number of ways. And Balerion didn't die. Balerion was still sitting right there. So (laughs) that really argues a lot for Aegon being the reason people were keeping their cool and waiting or biding their time to unleash their vengeance slash violence slash opportunism on a weaker king. One they saw coming because Aenys had plenty of time to demonstrate his mm, less strength than his father the fact that he wasn't as powerful or dangerous or whatever they saw it cut so that'll be a main topic for us next time and we hope you join us for that it will be great and fun the trivia answer the question was the first the first king of Aaron hall or died thanks to balerion the first lord of Aaron hall quentin coharis died of a fall from a horse We talked about that as a possible code for murder. We don't know for sure that it was, but it might have been. So yeah, next time, Aegon's, the rest of his family, all his grandchildren and his sons and Visenya and his daughter-in-law, his other daughter-in-law, and then his death and how that transitioned. Assuming we can fit all that into one episode, (laughs) which I think we can, but if not, we'll just go where the material takes us, continue making our way through fire and blood, having a great time with the material and with each other. Uh, I mentioned a couple of episodes that you might, more than a couple episodes that are in our (laughs) back catalog that might be good for y'all to listen to before the dragons of whether uh, and under the dragons, Uh, the episode on Balerion, the episode on Dragonstone, the episodes on Valarian and Celtigar houses. Uh, Maybe you're interested in, the Hardcore Houses episode that we did recently that talks about a lot about some of the Dornish houses and houses in the north. Or perhaps you are interested in something completely outside of the Targaryen dynasty, like, say, the Reigns of Castamere episode that we mentioned last time. We talked about the Lannisters a bit this time, so why not throw that in there? Yeah. And Highgarden. We have an episode on Highgarden, which reminds me of what I just said about maybe doing a full episode on King's Landing sometime. If you have ideas for topics that you want us to cover, let us know at History of Westeros, or rather Westeros History at gmail.com or anywhere you find History of Westeros on social media. 
Did you all have any last bits to add? I know, Sean, you wanted to give some shout outs, so we can uh, pivot to you for that. Yeah, I always have fun naming all some patron names. Uh, I, I hope everyone out there appreciates it, whether you have one or not. I hope you appreciate hearing these names. We've got, this is Sir Glennon of House Leanne called Lion Cloak. Nice. And we have Lord Captain Commander Hama Helmuth, the Sellsword Sentinel. Mm -hmm. And then here's one a lot of people might recognize. The Radio Westeros Dancers, <laughs> one of our patrons. You have to say it a certain way. It's the Radio Westeros Dancers. Oh, yes. <laughs> you have to say it like a 1960 Carney, 1960s Carney. <laughs> the Radio Westeros Dancer. There you oh, go. that was really good. Or radio host. Really yes, that was good. Sean, that was good. Actually. I got practice from that from uh, Korra. Oh. The Airbender series. They had a character like that. The, the, the narrator, the intro of each episode was in that style. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a couple more here. Sir, Sir, Peter, Sir Peter Stoic. Sorry, let me start that over. Sir Peter, the Stoic, who looked the drowned god in the face. Yikes. Gave the jade blade, whose foes are skewered and grilled. <laughs> and finally, Sir Ben, the green bear, who sees victory. I see victory. The bear sense. Mm hmm. <laughs> Thanks as well to Nina for her great takes. Lots of good discussion points from her today, which is. As it always often, or as it always often, as it often is. That's right. Thanks as well to Joey, Jesse, Bran, and Michael Klarfeld for our video intros and music. You guys make us look so fancy and professional and, and sound fancy and professional as well. We appreciate that for sure. And those of you who support us, whether it's on Patreon or Spotify, if you want to do so, go to historyofwesteros.com. We've got links to all the various ways you can support us or engage with our sponsors, or just find any one of our episodes. Ashea has made our great episode searcher, which you can also find there. So everything we talk about should be available, or you can find the links to it on historyofwesteros.com. It's kind of the catch-all, if you will. Until next time, my friends and fellow Westorians, you know what to do. Valar Reredus.